18. Back in the canyon, I showered off the wine. A breeze blew in the scent of honeysuckle. When it wasn't unbearably hot in Topanga, the mountain air was reviving and the color of the falling night was extravagant with tangerines and purples. It felt wonderful, leaving her house. Every time I left a man's house after a long afternoon, or if he had been the one to leave mine, the evening was tainted. I would wander the blocks of Manhattan, stopping in certain bars and eating raw meat, carpaccio or tartare. Martini Mondays with Big Sky were devil dark. On Martini Mondays, he would come at five and leave before seven. My chest would be cool with perspiration, glasses of Pilsner in the sink. I'd leave my apartment just after he did, like it was on fire. I couldn't bear to be in it after night fell. He would eat takeout on the Upper West Side, sating the hunger that came from beer on an empty stomach and fervent fucking on my leather couch. His wife had these incredible teeth, and I would picture her jaw opening for a triangle of steaming pizza. Laughter and the baby and Coca-Cola. Meanwhile, I would sit on a stool in a dim bar and make the tartare last for an hour. In hindsight, it was obvious. Talking to Alice made me realize the thing that I would end up doing was inevitable. Every single man in my life staked the path to murder. I'm not supposed to feel this, but I do. I don't think the act was vile. I think it was necessary. You can decide that for yourself. I will never lie to you. You are the only person to whom I will never lie. Before going to bed, I stepped outside to get some air, to walk around the mounds of dry earth. I was happy. I should have known I didn't deserve it. I saw Lenny in an unlikely place, walking toward Kevin's house, down the ravine with the blue stem scratching at his old ankles. I figured he was having an episode, and I called out to him. More rapidly than I would have thought possible, Lenny made his way up the hill. I'm terrifically happy to see you, Joan. Are you? I'm having the clearest of days, the clearest I've had in a very long time. I suppose I'm trying to coax the clarity into hanging around by offering a sacrifice unto the universe. The drugs I have to take turn the funhouse mirror of my mind's eye into a pane of glass, and it's sublime. But even better, even more sublime, is this. Right before the dosages are due, I'm able to make out a different scene in the funhouse mirror. It's only available to me once every several days. Nothing to do with providence, but, rather, something in the timing of the drug interactions. The wearing off of one joined with the peaking of another. It would take me... I venture, longer than I have left to live to figure the timing enough to replicate it. But in that sliver of time, I can see even clearer than 2020. I can see the whole past with flawless vision. Better than hindsight, because it's as though I am reliving it. I can see things like a god. The clarity is so perfect that it transcends the pain. I imagine this is what dying is like. Would you like to come inside? I would love that, he said. I made us tea and we sat at my kitchen table. Lenny slurped his tea and clasped his hands and breathed in deeply. There are things, he said, all the accumulated bits of a lifetime. They come back to you suddenly when you have clarity, some peace because something you dread is no longer there. You know the way you listen to the cleaning ladies of a hotel, the network of them talking loudly to one another, and to the maintenance man? They are all cousins, related, all of them roasting pigs on the weekend, buying kegs of beer with their crumpled dollar bills. They're loud and raucous around each other. But then, when they knock on your door, they are suddenly quiet. Housekeeping, they say in a certain tone. I nodded hatefully. For one month, I had been a housekeeper in a hotel. Not a fine hotel, but a decent one with both an indoor pool and an outdoor pool. I took naps or read books in the unused affair rooms. They smelled of paint and funerals. 
I was so young then. I didn't mind the married men looking at me in my black uniform, the starched hem falling at my knees. Oh, Joan, I can't explain it well enough, I fear. The reasons for everything come to me in those moments of hyperclarity. I can understand the lives of those housekeepers. I never thought of them enough, but somewhere I ingested their souls. I wouldn't be human if I hadn't. Perhaps a better way to tell it is the smell of grass. You know, of course, the smell of cut grass. But when was the last time you truly smelled it? I believe the smell of grass exists more as a trope after the age of 12. Between 12 and 30, I'd venture you never smell it. Then suddenly you are 30, 40, and you think, ah, cut grass. I was bored. He was an old racist who thought he was progressive. But I wanted what he had. I wondered if he would leave it to me. His money, his plates, his watch. Even if he would, I couldn't wait that long. The easiest thing would be to take it when he was out of his gourd and I was Lenore. But he would know it was me when he came out of it. I was sure of it. In any case, that was the last night I would feel sorry for the old man. After that evening, I would want to kill him. And that's the thing I want to tell you, Joan. That's the thing that became clear to me early this morning. One of the visions. I am, in fact, worse than damaged. He began to tremble. I've told you, he said, about Sandstone. Yes, the Swinger Mansion. Just down the road. Now it's nothing. All boarded up. But then it was something. I thought you didn't go. I did. We did. You and Lenore. You must understand, and few people your age can, but those days it was... Everything was changing. We didn't know. We thought we were being swept in a wave to a new world. In a way, it didn't feel like there was a choice. The first time we went, it was after a soiree at the Getty. A couple we were talking to. The husband was an important producer, and his wife was this gorgeous thing. I'll never forget it. She wore a silver dress, just two strips of material going down either side of her chest, meeting at the waist, so there was just bare skin all down through here. Leonard elevated his hand in the air an inch away from my breastbone. They told us they were going to an after event at Sandstone. They invited us along. We'd heard of it, of course. I was intrigued. I'm a man. But Lenore was, too. She was curious about all life. She wasn't afraid of anything. We took our champagne flutes along and followed their car. The first thing that happened when we pulled into the drive was we watched the other couple emerge from their car completely nude. We sat there for a minute, turned our headlights off. Lenore looked at me and rubbed my shoulder. Come on, Len, she said. We're bound in all the right ways. Then she kissed me deeply, lifted her white sundress over her body, very much like the one you never seem to take off and she opened the car door and walked to meet the other couple. They both put an arm around her. The man's touched her rear. Something happened inside of me. I wanted to kill her. I wanted to kill all three of them. More accurately, I wanted to fuck the other woman until I came, and then pull it out and jam it down Lenore's throat until she gagged. I had to hold the vomit back with my palm, at that point, I didn't even know the half of it. Joan, he said, I'm sorry. The skin may crease, but the blood is the same. I was always a jealous man. Protective, I used to say. Ha, huh. protective of my own ego is more like it. But you went inside, I said. I did. Women in braids with their small, tight bodies, men fawning over them. In the living room, where the largest clump was gathered, a bearded man played a guitar, and around him couples kissed, all naked, in each other's laps, stroking each other's legs. 
Every part of me wanted to jump into it. To just fuck and suck and become wet with those women. And with Lenore. But the idea of something being done to Lenore by someone else. I couldn't manage the rage. Until that night, I don't think Lenore knew that part of me. I'd hid it all along. But that night there was no more denying it. She thought we could enter together as a couple into this new land. The idea was that if you truly loved each other, if your love was deep and your heart was pure, that you would want your partner to experience the bliss of other bodies. You would respect the animal tendencies. You could fuck and let fuck and call it making love. And yet after making love was over, you would go home with your wife and eat ice cream and wash yourselves and go to bed. What happened? Nothing much happened that night. We observed. The couple we'd followed there, they'd been leading us around. At one point, the woman tugged on Lenore's hand. She tried to bring her into an embrace, tried to coax her back to her husband. Like Lenore was a fresh catch, she was bringing her master. She winked at me, like she would be my prize if I let Lenore go. I wanted to kill her for it. I wanted to fuck her first. I had my underwear on. I was one of the only ones in that room of snakes. Briefs? Yes, there were no boxers. Why did you keep them on? I hope you're not insinuating something. I never wanted four in that department. All the same, I felt discarded. I felt the whole room could sense my jealousy. Lenore stayed tucked into me. She politely turned down all the looks. She squeezed my hand. We walked back to our car, put our clothes on, and drove home. We didn't speak of it for some time. But something had been lit inside me. A profound rage. Lenore and I had been trying to have children. We'd been married by then for four years and trying almost all that time. Each month that she bled, she would try to hide her sadness from me. That same week we first went to Sandstone coincided with Lenore seeing a fertility doctor who told her everything in her system looked fine. He wanted me to go in and get checked, my count. I refused. She didn't nag me. She wasn't one of those. She was one of the last fine women, a European sensibility. Leonard was tearing up. His grief was a lie. I knew when grief was a lie. It was one of my superpowers. Even though his voice had become odious to me, I was curious. Curiosity is something that has always driven me. I am depraved and curious. I went back, he said, groaning. Well, of course you did. There was a night Lenore lit candles all over the house, the one you're in now. She walked the rafters at the top and set red votives down. Pillar candles on the floor. The whole room was glowing like a church. We made love on the bed. It was the best lovemaking of our relationship. It felt like the best lovemaking in the history of the world. That was the night. She ordained it. That was the night she was going to conceive our child. I shuddered to think of the heat in the house and the candles on top of it, and this poor wife of his, spreading her legs for this insolent asshole. Once again, I'd trusted a man. Once again, I'd felt sympathy for a man who was not good. I don't know what kind of woman you are, Joan. Some women are not built for babies. I don't think that's bad. Biology is enigmatic but deliberate. It selects some for procreation and others it marks for a different path. Women like you are necessary to let off the steam, to depressurize the cabin. Women like me are good for men to fuck when they're not ready for baby making with good Midwestern girls like Lenore. That's not how I meant it. Fuck you. I deserve that, old girl. So you and Lenore, the mother of all mothers, fucked in a temple of love and lit all the magic candles to usher the insemination along. And then? 
and then nothing. Her cycle came. It was a terrible day. You know about the coyotes and the cycles? I nodded, and Lenny did too, solemnly. The coyotes circled the house. They howled before she even started to bleed. They could smell the blood traveling down her tubes. I heard her upstairs, the whimper. My blessed bride. A good man would have gone and comforted her. But I only felt rage. Rage at myself, but also at her, like a real damn dog. I was angry at my bride for showing me the extent of my futility. Then further down it went, the boiling anger, down my hips and into my shaft. I wonder if you know how rage can stiffen the shaft. It's like a war cry. I left the house engorged. I drove up the canyon to sandstone. I didn't check in at the main house, but sneaked to the yard at the back where the trampoline was. There was a tall American Indian girl laughing and jumping up and down, her tits like turkey waddles, shaking. Two men were watching, and two other women, a couple of pale whore blondes, all of them naked and slim as snakes. Nothing looked human to me. I was the stiffest I'd ever been. I climbed the trampoline and tackled the American Indian girl like a wolf. I stripped down and knelt her on all fours and got behind her like an animal. Look at me. I'm built like a rich man, not like a beast. But that day, I was a beast, and none of them stopped me. After all, they'd built that place to act like animals, and here was a man dispensing with the formality. I was full of rage because I was being denied the one right of all humans. The one reason we are on this earth. To procreate. So I fucked the American Indian girl with my rage, and then the two blondes as the two men looked on. They stroked their cocks and watched me take what I was owed. I shook my head in revulsion. I thought I'd expended all my disgust on hearing from men about what they were owed. You are shocked, Joan. I'm an old man now. The evils we have done would be pointless if they didn't get passed down, so that others might not make the same mistake. Wouldn't you say, Joan? I know you have secrets, too. Nobody comes to the canyon unless they do. I bit my lip. I tried to keep my hands in my lap away from his throat. My point was that Lenore was only four children. She wanted only to be a wife and a mother but a mother first, a mother always. Joan, that isn't you. I don't know you too well, but I hope you'll allow me that. I love a woman like you. A part of me always wished to have that, a woman I could do battle with. Perhaps it would have suited me better. Perhaps my story would have turned out differently. I don't care how your story would have turned out, Lenny. You wanted to gag a woman with your cock. That's not the bad part, I'm afraid. I'm still getting there. You see, I want to come clean. I pushed him to the door and then outside the threshold. Please, Joan, I'm an old man. I don't expect you to feel sorry. I only... I only feel sorry for your wife, Lenny. This stupid woman who wanted a child that you were too empty to give her. I spat and watched a bubble of my saliva land on the bridge of his nose. I don't know where the impulse came from, but it made me feel more powerful than I had ever felt before. I slammed the door in his face. Then I walked up the spiral staircase and took off my white dress to go to sleep. When you've been raped in a dress, you might think you want to burn it. But I didn't. In the morning, there was a knock on my door. Alice was early. I hadn't pulled myself together as much as I'd wanted to. I checked my face in the hallway mirror. I smoothed down my hair and opened the door. I'd completely forgotten about the little girl. She had Vic's face. That was the most remarkable thing. 
his face staring back at me, his probing eyebrows, the shining balls of his pale cheeks. The way she held herself in my doorway was all her father, an uneven confidence. Then I realized we'd met before. She'd come to visit her father in the first few months of my employment. I was enjoying the early days of being the boss's pet. I remember she came around to my desk, smiling at me dreamily. She'd probably been ten or so, and I'd been twenty-seven. She introduced herself and didn't say much more, just smiled and hung around my desk until her father called her away. He must have told her I was a star or something, a real go-getter in the advertising world. He must have said something so that she'd take note of me because he wanted to show me off to everyone in his orbit, even his own child. Women always talk about how men are so compartmentalized, how they can fuck some cosmetics manager all week, then go home and play Scrabble with their kids and scratch their wife's back. But Vic had just one compartment, and it was only for me. His love for his children was real and large, no doubt, but his mania for me was tantamount. Eleanor, I said. You used to be hot, she said, adjusting the wire-rimmed glasses on her face. I blinked. She wore frayed jean shorts and a pair of white sneakers and a pullover sweatshirt that said Esprit in large rainbow letters across the front. Thanks, I said. Do you know why I'm here? She said. It sounded foreboding because of how nice and childlike her face was. But for the same reason, it also sounded ridiculous. I think so, I said. Her hands were trembling inside her pullover, which she was using like a muffler. Do you want to invite me inside? Wouldn't that be stupid of me? I'll do it right here, I don't care. I could see she thought she meant it. She was soaked through with pain and rage. I'd been there before. I understood exactly. But how could I be afraid of this little girl? of my child self standing there on the threshold. I told her to come inside. I opened the door wide and walked backward. Eleanor advanced slowly, pulling a gun from the front pocket of her pullover. It was marvelous in its smallness and blackness and made her seem like an adult. She kept the gun pointed at me. Gradually, her hands stopped trembling she looked up at the high ceilings of my oven of a house. Not what you pictured, I asked. She shook her head. Not like the movies, I said. Fuck you, she said. Fuck you. Sit down. I sat down at the kitchen table, and she advanced until she was four feet away. I assumed that was the distance at which she was confident about hitting her target. I can see your nipples, she said softly. I looked down at them. All talk of nipples made me think of my mother. In her big round eyeglasses with her layered blonde hair and her white 70s breasts. She was the buxom beautiful of movie stars. Her nipples were enormous. You could see them through wool sweaters. Do you want to hear a story, she asked. The gun was pointed at my head. I told her that of course I did. You probably already know, she began, how we go as a family to Anguilla every year. I nodded. Vic had spun it to me as his wife's trip, the highlight of her cold season, their Easter jaunt to Anguilla. Last year, she continued, Dad told us at the last minute he couldn't go. He said he had to work and it couldn't be remote. He had to be in the office. Such a fucking load, and we knew it. My mom was really upset. I think she knew about you, or at least had an idea about you. She swept it under the rug, I guess. But Anguilla was really important to her. It was like the only time she had my dad in front of her every day for ten days. It was heaven for my mom. We'd get a nanny, too. This girl from the island and she'd watch Robbie for most of the time so my mom could pretend she was this 
free woman with her husband, you know? Every night is date night on Anguilla, she said. She drank a lot, which she never did at home. And she was just so happy. Dad was happy too. I mean, especially in the beginning, when I was a little kid, before Robbie was born. He and I would go snorkeling and shell picking, and we built sand castles and collected sand crabs. After Robbie, it was hard. My dad sort of detached from things. Not from me so much, but from my mom and Robbie. They were like this set of broken dolls or something. I think he thought that if he detached from them, he could live a normal life. She looked like she was about to start crying. I asked if she wanted to sit down. She moved slowly and sat across from me. The table was long enough that she could keep the gun resting on it and point it at my neck without worrying about my reaching and trying to grab for it. She talked as though we were friends and she needed to unload. Like she was me and I was Alice. Two days before the trip, he said he couldn't go. Literally two days. My mom was devastated. She had all their stuff packed in one suitcase. She'd been walking four miles every day to lose her pooch, and she'd bought all these outfits. She said they should just postpone it, and he said, no, no. We would lose all our money, the flights, the house we rented. He was really smart, I'm sure you know, calculated like that. He told her after it was too late to do anything about it. He said, the kids deserve it. You deserve it. You've got to go. I didn't get it then. She knew what was going on, and it was killing her. That he was sending her away so he could be with you. Uninterrupted, or whatever. I thought back to the previous April. Big Sky had gone on a camping trip with friends to Chile. It was probably the second darkest time of my life after what had happened in the Poconos. In my apartment, I looked at the couch where we had fucked and everything else he had touched or commented upon. I felt empty and scared because even though deep down I knew it was almost over, I didn't want to believe it. And anyway, nothing is sure. I didn't feel like drinking wine. It was the early evening, five or so. I saw on social media the picture his friends had posted. He was not online in any way, and so I had to dig to find them. His group of friends, 36 to 40, wealthy and sure of their next 40 years. There is no more powerful group in the world than men in that age range with money, with tasteful wives and pretty children, family homes in Bridgehampton and Nantucket, brunches. I couldn't help thinking about the women who would let their attractive and wealthy husbands take group trips to Chile and Argentina, where the men would get together with a group of girls in their 20s building fires and drinking mate and climbing mountains with all the right gear. There was a blonde girl in one photograph wearing rainbow leg warmers and holding a sausage on a stick to the fire, leaning toward the fire on slender haunches. And there was Big Sky beside her, looking at her. The picture came alive in my brain. I could see them close to each other the whole trip, walking in a pair up rocky terrain, I could see him helping her across a slim river, experiencing that brand of breathtaking crush that developed over time back in middle school. I could see day seven of the trip. I imagined it was cold and warm at once. They were together at the fire, everyone else asleep, sharing a thermos of whiskey, laughing quietly. He would bring her a thick serape blanket and wrap it around her shoulders the way he had done for me in the bar that night with his jacket. That was the ridiculous moment when I arranged myself on the same side as his wife, like here the two of us were in homely New York City, waiting at home for him. I felt absurd. I texted him, how goes it, Montana? And a full day later, he wrote, hella fantastic, chili is tops. The air went out of me. It was the end. I called Vic. I told him I was feeling suicidal, and would he take me to dinner? And now here this girl was because of what Vic had done to his wife. Because of what Big Sky had done to me. Because of what my father had done to my mother. The pattern must end with you. 
Do you remember April? She asked me. Yes, I said. The weather was beautiful. Were you with my father? We went to dinner every night. And he stayed overnight with you? No, I said. Which was true, because by then our sexual relationship was completely over. He would just sit across from me, watching me eat, listening to me talk. Why not? Because I didn't want to. I was in love with another man. Another married man? I nodded. How did you become such a fucking whore? It's a long story. I don't want to hear your long story. I want to tell you about Anguilla. My mother tried to kill herself. What? That's funny that he didn't tell you. That's really fucking funny to me. He didn't tell me. That's probably the sickest part of it. My fucking mom tried to kill herself because she knew he was fucking you, or whatever, not even fucking you, but paying for your whore dinner. Actually, I think that's the part that really got to my mom. All the dinners. She spent like two weeks after his funeral just going over all the credit card statements and looking up the restaurants online and checking out what you both ordered, looking at the dishes on Yelp. I felt tears coming to my eyes. Not for Vic's wife, but for my mother. Oh, are you feeling something for us? Wow. Cool. So let me give you the full picture. We ate dinner at Picante, our favorite Mexican place. It was really fucking weird to be there without my dad. And Robbie, who was three years old and would always have been three years old, you know he had downs, right? Robbie was acting out. He threw a fork at the waitress. The fork hit her in the face and she started bleeding. And that was the last straw for my mom. We're there with the crab guacamole appetizer that was my dad's favorite. And Robbie throws a fork at the waitress. And mom was just staring at this family at the next table. This young family with two little kids. A boy and a girl. Like us. But this boy was normal. And the mom and dad looked happy. And they were both in shape. Even though my dad wasn't, like, the most good-looking man, my mom always treated him like he was a movie star. Anyway, mom didn't even apologize to the waitress. She left a bunch of bills on the table and walked out, and I picked up Robbie and we followed her. None of us had eaten. Robbie was crying and hitting himself, and mom just kept moving. We took a taxi back to our bungalow. Later that night, I found her in the bathroom, passed out on the floor. The grimy-ass bathroom that wasn't even nice because my dad had been renting a cheaper house the past few years. Probably to save up for buying you dinners and following you around Mexico. Jesus Christ, I said. I remember the night she was talking about. Vic and I were having late drinks at a tiki bar in Soho that dressed their drinks with pink orchids and green shards of shiso. His phone vibrated in his pocket, and he took it out. When he answered the phone in public, he always covered his mouth. I believe this was somewhat out of decorum, but likely he also did it for privacy. Vic kept so many secrets from all of us. He rose and walked out the door of the bar. He was gone for ten minutes or so. In that time, I sipped my drink morosely and checked all the relevant outlets of social media, for new information on Big Sky's vacation. His wife had posted on Facebook, he's home, with a kissing emoji, plus one of champagne and a bubble bath. Would they fuck tonight, I wondered? I had no idea how often they did. He never talked about her. Just as Vic rarely talked about his wife. The wives of cheaters lived in private rooms with white lotions and thick jars and soft lighting. When Vic came back inside, he was not visibly shaken, but he was changed. I didn't think too much of it. Often after a few drinks, he would begin to sulk in my presence. He spent so much energy during the day trying to convince me that he only wanted the best for me, even if the best thing for me was not him. That at night his goodwill would run dry, and the whiskey he drank would turn him into a goblin. And when he came back in from outside... 
He simply looked like he was in one of those brooding states. When he sat, his elbows dug forlornly into his navy knees. Were you with him that night? Eleanor said. I stuttered and she cocked the gun. I couldn't believe it. She repeated the question angrily. Yes, I said. We had drinks and he walked me home. Do you remember him taking a phone call? I nodded. I called to tell him mom tried to kill herself. I called from the hospital in Anguilla that looked like a rundown motel and nobody wore gloves. And Robbie was screaming so loud. Mama's dead, mama's dead, and beating himself. And slamming his head against a wall over and over. And I was so scared. And I want to know, did my father take the phone call before or after he walked you home? She was crying and her face was mottled, white and red. I thought about what to say. I almost always lied. Did that make me a bad person? I don't know the answer. Answer the question, she said, her hands trembling with the gun. If you lie to me, I'll fucking kill you so slow, man. He walked me home, I whispered, after he found out your mom tried to kill herself. Nineteen. My father returned to the Poconos the following afternoon. In my memory, it was the sunniest day. They asked me if I would like to get dropped off at the pool. Later, I would realize it was because they needed to talk, but in the moment, I remember thinking they were going to have sex. Sex defined their relationship, at least in my mind. I couldn't believe they were willing to drop me off without supervision. I was excited by the prospect, but more so wounded. My mother had exiled me from her bed the previous night, and now this. That was when it dawned on me, the unsettling feeling that my parents' lives did not revolve around me. I'd grown up thinking I was the center of their world. Even when my mother yelled at me or locked me out of her bedroom, it was because I had the power to infuriate her. It was because she loved me. It could be argued that my learning it when I did, at the age of 10, was perfect timing. Old enough to have experienced cozy solipsism for many years, young enough to change the way I walked through the world, to be cautious. I went to my room and put on my black two-piece with the Technicolor butterflies. I applied coconut-flavored lip gloss and clopped out in my wood and leather candies with kitten heels. I said, I want to go to the top of the world. My father acquiesced and took me to the rich pool. Rich, to think of it now. Perhaps it was the drab tiki bar that attracted me. All my life, I have been charmed by the trappings of the South Seas. I've looked for establishments with lighted puffer fish in tanks, with towering fake palms, rock walls, and outriggers dripping down from the painted ceilings and it started with that tiki bar at the top of the world. In the car, my father was not himself, and yet my father was always my father in a way that my mother was not always my mother. There were hours, entire days, that my mother was an individual apart from me. I think it's mostly because of this, and not the devastation that would happen very early the next morning, that I thought I would always love my father more. You're not going to leave the pool area, you understand? Yes, Daddy. What if I want a snack? I'm giving you five dollars. You can buy a snack and eat it in the pool area. What he didn't know was that there was no traditional snack bar at the rich pool, only a vending machine indoors, up two flights of sapphire stairs. It wasn't part of the pool area. Only the tiki bar was in the pool area. I was always making sure to follow rules, but I knew how to bend them. They were so strict, and my mother was so observant. But there were hours, like I said, when her eyes were closed to me. And these were the hours I figured out how to lighten my arm hair and have an orgasm. Daddy, I'm sorry about Grandma. He kept his eyes on the tree-lined roads ahead. He nodded and swallowed. 
She's going to be fine, he said. My father accepted succor from no one. I can't imagine what it was like for a man like him to know his elderly mother was raped. To what extent the reel of that scene would play in his mind. Is she scraped up? Not too bad. Does it look like she fell down some stairs? He looked at me. He had no conception of what I knew. Fathers never know that about their daughters. Partly it's because they don't want to know, but really it's because they cannot know. It's psychologically dangerous to see inside your daughter's brain. And I knew so much more than most girls my age because of the way I listened. Tonight, do you want to go to dinner at Villa Volpi? Yes. Maybe just the two of us? We'll give Mommy a break, let her take it easy at home. My shoulders fell far down beneath my neck. I nodded. I longed for something that was in the past, only I didn't know it yet. Vic once said to me, families are silly. The whole concept is silly. He said that because he didn't want his family, but he would have wanted one with me. Me and him at the supermarket, pushing around a pudgy Vic Jr. in a cart, buying grape tomatoes. We pulled into the parking lot. I was saddened by the glass of sunlight on the macadam, by the fake smile on my father's goateed mouth. He would have died for me, but because he was a man, he didn't know how he was hurting me by doing the things he thought had nothing to do with his daughter. I'll pick you up at 4.30, right here. The car will be right here, but I want you to wait inside the gate. Do you understand? Yes. No disobeying. No disobeying, I repeated. He kissed my forehead. I brought the book I was reading. All the books I read were hand-me-downs from my parents. My mother's V.C. Andrews, my father's Dean Kuntz. In this case, it was Stephen King's The Stand. I liked how massive it was, that it would last me a month. I chose a chaise long near the tiki bar. I removed my terry jumper and laid myself down like my mother, legs bent and knees pinched together. I read my book and concentrated on the way I looked reading it. I was only ten years old, and yet I remember having that thought that day. Only a few years earlier, I'd been a pure child, reveling in the space between the Christmas tree and the corner of the wall where the colored lights blinked for me alone, and it looked like heaven. Or wearing a princess dress to go to Maggie's pub, this seamy place with a green plaid carpet and high top tables. We'd go when my mother was in the mood for chicken wings. She loved the cheap parts of an animal, all varieties of awful. But wings were the easiest parts to come by, and we'd go for nickel wing nights, and I'd play on the crummy carpet beneath our table. They would talk, and I would play with my dolls down there. Their voices, their love above my head. Below, all the independence I needed. I didn't yet know my mother was a hypochondriac, or that she could be crueler on occasion than she already was. I didn't yet know my father's secret, or maybe he didn't have it yet. There was nothing in the world better than the past. That day at the rich pool, as I moved my body like an older girl, I noticed a man at the bar, perhaps because he noticed me. He had a mustache and wore a white linen shirt and khaki swim trunks. He was in his mid-forties, the age of my parents. He was sitting side-saddle on the stool so that he could take inventory of the landscape. He was sipping something tall, reddish, and tropical. His bare knees made something thump inside of me, the way he held his drink. I could see up the hollow of his shorts, a miraculous darkness. I imagined my parents a few miles away rustling in a hot, damp bed. I imagined my grandmother in orange, pinioned against her brown couch with the Doberman piss. I made a fire between the inside of my knees. I thought of the word fucking. I wrote it inside my skull in light bright. The man was close enough to talk to me from the bar. He waited until the bartender made drinks from his gun at the other end. I heard the man clearly over the splashing water and the summertime songs on the speaker. He engaged me to begin with about Stephen King. He said he admired a young woman reading such a big book. 
that he called me a young woman was both tantalizing and repulsive. He told me his name was Wilt and that he was from Boise, Idaho. He was getting his parents' place ready to sell. They had just died, his dad of emphysema and his mom of suicide by cancer shortly thereafter. He laughed, and I laughed too, as though I knew what he meant. Joan, he said, I've never met a woman under the age of 40 with the name Joan. Isn't that funny? I didn't smile or nod. I'd learned that from my mother. Men go wild for a woman who is quiet like a cat, a woman who doesn't always approve. Joan likes mystery and horror and long walks on the beach. I don't like the beach, I said. She doesn't like the beach because it's very sandy. The sand is insidious. The sand makes her skin crawl. Well, I like the beach in Italy. Ah, Joan makes an exception for the Mediterranean. The sand there is more like pebbles, less insidious. She enjoys fruit cups on the blue and white hotel towels. I smiled. In the water, a girl about my age was tossing a penny and diving for it. She was pale and wore goggles. I knew what rape meant, but only vaguely. I knew it meant sex against one's will, but sex to me was what I saw on HBO. Softcore hydraulics, fit bodies moving against each other, very involved French kissing. So that when I pictured my grandmother being raped, she was one of those HBO women, only older, and her rapist was one of those men, only rougher. I pictured my grandmother open-mouthed kissing during her rape, accepting a tongue into her mouth but with a look of dismay on her wrinkled, rouged face. Are you here with anybody, Joan? My daughter is playing in the pool right there, I said, pointing at the diving girl. Now it was the man's turn to laugh. Joan of Snark, he said. When you're ready to move on from Stephen King, I think you should like Henry Miller. Have you heard of him? I didn't say anything. No? What a shame. What do they teach in those schools nowadays? Compound interest and fractions and pie. Let me tell you, Joan, you will never need to know pie in your life. School is only good for making other people believe you're smart. School doesn't make you smart. What makes you smart? Reading Henry Miller, for one. D.H. Lawrence, a close second. Nabokov, ahead of Miller, come to think of it. Have you heard of Lolita? No. Heavens, but I suppose you can name all six continents. There's seven. Aha. The bartender turned to the man, Wilt's, corner of the bar and asked if he would like a refill. Wilt said yes and asked for a cup of water as well. I liked the way he spoke to the bartender. He was genteel like my father, but a little more authoritative. He was even a little rude. When the bartender disappeared again, Wilt poured the water out at his feet and filled the plastic cup with some of his drink and then, in one deft movement, placed it on the ground beside my chair. Some geographers would say there are six, he said, not missing a beat, if you combine Europe and Asia to make Eurasia. I picked up the drink and sipped it. It was sweet and tart at once. I looked across the lounge deck at the mostly female bathers, holding books or magazines and wearing big sunglasses, taking the sun, my mother called it with her accent. It sounded spoiled the way she said it. But she took the sun, too. She undid the strings of her bathing suit so she wouldn't get tan lines. She'd drink water from a tumbler, and the SPF cream from her lips would melt onto the rim of the glass. Why did I always want to be around my mother? She didn't make me feel terribly loved. She didn't give herself up for me, the way many mothers did for their children. At the same time, besides taking the sun and eating chicken wings... She also wasn't living for herself. In Idaho, Wilt said, we don't traffic much in municipal pools or association pools. We don't have any tiki bars. I've never been to Idaho, I said, which was such a stupid thing to say because I'd never really been anywhere. My parents didn't travel much beyond the Poconos and Italy. That went for everything else, too. We ate Chinese on Sunday nights, Otherwise, we had steak or pasta. 
For lunch nearly every day, my mother made pastina. Idaho is the most beautiful state. I don't say that because I live there. Pennsylvania, he said, well, I'm from here. In Pennsylvania, they grow a lot of bad apples. Are you a bad apple, I asked. I don't believe the words came out of my mouth in a sultry tone, but some lines can't be anything but sexual. He laughed and winked. New Mexico, he said, is number two, the second most beautiful state in the Union. Our next vacation is going to be to the American West, I said, echoing my father. You and your little girl? Yes, I said, me and Lulu. Lulu, what a nice name. How old is Lulu? Hmm, seven, I said. She'll be eight next week. Well, happy birthday, Lulu. What does she want for her birthday? Damned if I know. He laughed heartily at that. I spoke like the characters in the adult books I was reading. He swished his drink around in his cup. I drank the rest of what he'd given me. I'd had only one hard-boiled egg that morning because I'd been nervous about when my father would come home. Now I felt the liquid cool in the floor of my belly. My head felt like there were star-shaped bubbles inside of it, lifting my skull up from my neck. Joan, I need to get out of this heat now, Wilt said rather abruptly. I'm going up to my room for some shade. I nodded, heartbroken. My hair felt too short and dry. My book seemed like the biggest waste of time, and I never wanted to swim like a child again. Catch you around sometime. He rose and I saw how tall he was. I wondered if my mother would find him attractive. His legs were very dark with curls of hair. He wore fine leather shoes, the kind you wouldn't wear to a swimming pool. I watched him walk up the steps to the clubhouse. I looked back at the bar and saw a black leather wallet on the bamboo bar. The bartender noticed it at the same time. I know him, I told the bartender. I'll catch up. The bartender nodded carelessly. I grabbed the wallet off the bar and ran after him, barefoot in my two-piece. He'd already made it to the upper-level parking lot by the time I got there. Wilt, I said breathlessly. He was opening the door to a big black car when he turned to look at me. He smiled wide, and his teeth were very white in a way that was frightening. I was holding the wallet out and hopping from one foot to the other because of the burning macadam. Jesus, he said. Get in for a second, will you? I slid into the passenger side, and he got into the driver's side and started the car and lowered all the windows and blasted the air conditioning. The front seat was one long black leather bench. It smelled so foreign in the car, like snakeskin and old people. Joan of Snark, thank you. What a chivalrous thing to do. You know how rare it is to find a chivalrous woman in the world? What's funny is how I remember almost everything up until that point. After that, my memories are little blots. Driving through the top-of-the-world community. The light blue sky interrupted by trees. I don't remember talking. In the home of his dead parents, I do remember an old-fashioned wet bar. It was the coldest place I'd ever been all the furniture polar to the touch. We drank brown liquor in thick glasses with giant ice cubes. There were low leather couches the color of the cordials in my parents' liquor cabinet. I don't think I chose not to be afraid, but maybe I did. Maybe his hands did not frighten me because they were the only warm things in the place. I know that he helped form my body into the certain position he wanted, which was on all fours, on the mustard carpet, next to a gold-edged glass coffee table. But I knew from HBO movies how to hold myself. Also because of HBO, I'd already been having orgasms for over a year, watching steamy scenes and riding a balled-up comforter in the early morning while my mother made breakfast. As long as I could hear the spatula against a pan and the fridge opening and closing, I moved heartily toward a sensation I could barely comprehend. I don't know if the decor of the house comes from my memory or from the movies I saw. Maybe it's both. I don't remember if he ever went inside of me, but I do remember feeling pain. Sometimes I could see very clearly the way he licked every part of me above the knees and below the belly button. 
like a mother animal bathing its young with a wide tongue. He never took my bikini bottoms off, just uncovered the fabric section by section, looking for unlicked strips of flesh. I stayed very still. There was no music, no sound at all, except the sound of his tongue. I was back at the top of the world pool by four. I went into the deep end, sinking myself down to the uneven aqua floor and sitting there for as long as I could hold my breath, which was a very long time. By the time my father arrived at 429, I was inside the gate, exactly where he told me to wait, holding two books and drying my wet hair in the yellow mountain sun. The man had left the number for the landline of his parents' house, on the first page of Tropic of Cancer. Twenty. Eleanor stood and stretched her arms, extending the barrel of the gun at me. You have no idea how you fucked up my life, she screamed, and the walls of windows rattled in the hot house. You know my fucking baby brother is dead. Do you? Yes, your mother told me. Did she tell you she's pretty much the reason? She cocked the gun. Please, I said, and I didn't know where the next thing I said came from. It came from beyond me, from the seat of my stomach. Please, I lied. I'm pregnant. You're what? I'm pregnant. I found out last week. What the fuck? The gun began to shake so much in her hand that it dipped toward the floor. I pictured it falling, going off, and opening a cherry hole in my belly. One of those accidental deaths, the specialty of toddlers in Walmarts. I imagined Alice at my funeral. Big Sky, too. Then I imagined him seeing her. She would be in a black tuxedo. She would lay a red rose on my gleaming coffin, and he would get an erection. Is it my father's? Yes. Are you fucking sure? Yes. She found the wall with her hand and slumped down against it until she reached the floor. She cried and the gun shook in her hands. I was not one to comfort other women. I never embraced them or ran after them when they cried. Eleanor. Fuck you, don't talk to me. Okay, I said. I wanted to get up and clean some dishes, but I knew she wanted what everybody wanted, for me to remain in the same place forever. My rigidity reminded me of the way I used to still my body when I'd finally reached my mother's bed, afraid to make any moves that would wake her so that she might tell me to go back to my own room. The girl was trembling. I saw the ant-colored hairs piercing through her white skin. I'd stolen from her. I was a very careless thief who didn't even want her plunder. I'd been stealing my whole life. I'd walked out of bookstores with armloads of books carried whole lobsters, thwopping about in their sturdy white bags out of supermarkets. I'd stolen truffle honey, truffle salt, $2,000 dresses, $20 dresses, bras and underwear and shoes, headphones and batteries and flatware and Sharpie markers. I'd never in my life bought a container of Advil. And I'd stolen this child's father and then dumped him off. By proxy, I'd stolen her little brother. I thought to move toward Eleanor, to kick her hard in the face and take the gun and call the cops. But she kept her eyes on me even through the tears. Anyhow, I didn't trust myself to do those things. Her face was so remarkably his, it was as if he were right there. We sat for what seemed like a half hour, and I had the time to recall the things Vic told me he'd done for her. Out of the blue, he would write to me, I'm going to be busy a little later, kid, if you don't hear from me. I have to fix Eleanor's car. Eleanor has a deadly banana allergy, so I'm going out to stock up on about 10,000 more EpiPens. 
or in conversation he would say, I'm buying Eleanor a pony for Christmas. Many of the things he said he was doing for her, I knew he was telling me so I'd see what a devoted father he was. That he had the money to buy a horse, the skill to fix a carburetor. One night after I said I wanted ruby red slippers like Dorothy's, my father stayed up very late to glue red glitter onto a pair of ballerina shoes. In the morning, the shoes were at the foot of my bed, twinkling like fire. They were very hard with glue, and when I put them on, they scratched my skin. I was enthralled with the love behind the effort, the sweat on his brow. I loved him even then, as though he was already gone. I remember that day I met you, Eleanor said, at the office. I remember, too. You ate half of a grapefruit, cut into sections with a spoon. I started doing that, too. Basically, I wanted my father to see me eating grapefruit like that. I nodded. I didn't remember eating grapefruit in the office. When my mother was pregnant with Robbie... She found out from the doctor that he had a one in three chance of having trisomy 21, and she didn't tell my dad, because she knew, or she thought, he would have made her get an abortion. When Robbie was born, that's when he found out. When he saw his face as he came out of my mom's stomach, that was the moment dad left us. That was the moment we lost him. It wasn't you. You're nothing. Eleanor, I said, I'm sorry. Don't tell me you're sorry. You're a piece of shit. She transferred her weight from one foot to the other. She wiped her nose with the side of her arm. If you're telling the truth, then you're carrying my baby brother. His second chance. It was hard to believe Vic had a child who could believe a thing like that. Eleanor had been brought up by a religious mother and a devout grandmother. Vic hadn't been much for religion, though he took his wife to church every week. He christened his children. But the notion that Eleanor thought an unborn child might be her brother reincarnated was a bridge too far. On top of that, I wondered how she could be so sure that my fake pregnancy was a boy. And I'll let you live until you give birth to him. It was a ludicrous medieval thing to say. I didn't know how to respond. I wanted to laugh. I wanted her whole family out of my life. Please, Eleanor, don't say my name. I will cut your face. You don't need your face to give birth. And if you're lying, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to cut out your eyes. Her eyes were so little. I was tired of being a sponge. I wanted to kill her for saying something so silly. Where's the nearest supermarket? She said as though she were asking for directions. One time with Big Sky, there was a scare. We never used condoms. He always pulled out. He was good at it. There are men who don't know when they are about to come, and those men shouldn't be allowed to fuck. But Big Sky was careful and aware. This one time he was about to come at the same time that I was, and I didn't want him to pull out and ruin mine. I was on top and I squeezed my knees into the sides of his waist and crushed myself onto his pelvis with all my weight. I could feel him bucking to get me off, but I kept my eyes closed and pinned myself down. It was like the time I rode a mechanical bull in Nashville. I just concentrated on becoming one with the thing beneath me. At last, I went limp, and he shoved me off. What the fuck, he said. Are you fucking crazy? And I thought, am I? No, I decided I was not. In fact, I believed that was the only time in lovemaking that I truly acted for myself. He was in agony for the weeks that followed. I could tell that Sundays were the worst. Probably he and his wife and son would come back from a stroll around Central Park, eat a nice summer dinner on that impressive stone patio, and, after putting the child to bed, the wife would retire to their bedroom 
with the book that everybody was reading, and he would tarry downstairs, drink a Boddington's. He would text me around 11, just a question mark. Once I waited until the following morning and typed only the letter N. And then, realizing he might think I meant negative, I wrote another message to follow the first. Niet. We had the talk one weekday afternoon at Salumaria Rosie. I ordered prosciutto and bufala, and to fuck with him, I also ordered a pot of pickles. He said, listen, if it's... If you are, I'll take care of everything, obviously. To make sure I didn't misunderstand, he said, I mean financially, the procedure. I'll come with you too, of course, if you need me. I nodded. I loved that restaurant. The silken slices of prosciutto and the pillowy discs of mozzarella. But I didn't have an appetite. I thought that if I swallowed the pickles, I'd throw them right back up. Then he really would have shit his pants. My period finally came on a Sunday, and even then I didn't tell him I'd gotten it until Wednesday. When you're in love with a married man, the truth is that you are in hate with a married man, and you have to take sucker where you can find it. The supermarket I chose was the Ralph's in Pacific Palisades. I liked it because it was easy to park there. In the car, Eleanor kept her gun pointed at my face the whole time. She told me she didn't care about going to jail, that she would shoot me anywhere. I didn't believe her. The gun was likely not loaded. Or maybe it was. It's not that I didn't care if I died. It's that I knew I would survive. I parked my Dodge next to a motorcycle. She pressed the gun against my back going into the market. Once we got inside, she put it in her pocket. She followed me down the women's health aisle. There was a teen, and there was a woman in her 40s. The teen was looking at Monistat. The older woman was reading the back of a lubricant box. I took an EPT off the shelf because it was the brand I always bought. In the single-stall bathroom, I knew there was a small chance I might die. There was nothing I could do. I said, everyone will hear. And she said, I have nothing. I held up my mother's white dress and peed over the cream strip. I had always been fanatical about peeing for a very long time on the strip. But that time I did it quickly. Then I shook it off and rested it on the edge of the grimy sink. In the past, I would leave the strip in the bathroom for a long time. There's nothing more horrendous than coming back too soon. I didn't think about the possibility that the strip would be positive. I obviously hadn't fucked Big Sky the night Vic killed himself. I hadn't slept with Vic in ages, and I hadn't slept with anyone else. Until Marfa, which I didn't consider sex. Because the thing is, one could call it rape. It was half a rape, or three quarters of one. Like Alice said, there are rapes for which we shower, put on our nice shoes. The man, John Ford, had one of the ugliest faces I'd ever seen. Large, brownish teeth, horny gray eyes, zero lips. There was a sign outside the hotel, we're open when we're open. I sat in the lobby bar eating ceviche with two thick rings of jalapenos and drinking Bloody Marys. The cubes of tuna on my plate were dark and warm and stringy. He sat down next to me and asked the bartender for a grasshopper. Even from not very close, his breath smelled like metal. A song I liked played in the lobby, and he smiled as I moved my body to it. Later, when we were in his motel room, he would play the same song. He acted like I should be impressed. I found it ridiculous. I tried to leave twice. I couldn't say how he got me to stay the first time. Maybe it was the idea that it would be a free night of sleep. But the second time he gripped my arm. The hold didn't really hurt. I could have freed myself in that first moment. He turned me so I was facing away from him and lifted up just the back of my dress. 
He swiped my underwear to one side and pulled my right leg away from my left. He did it very crudely, laughing, so that it was like a mock of rough handling. His penis was indefensibly small. When he slid himself inside me, I couldn't believe it wasn't a finger. It felt like a little length of chalk. Yeah, he said over and over, going in and out, pincer gripping my arm. I squirmed and said, please stop. But I didn't say it loud enough. I didn't try to push him off because I was worried he would become more violent. Grossly, I was feeling bad about the size of his penis. I didn't want him to know how absurd it felt, and yet I hated him with every cell in my body. That was when the seed of what I would end up doing was planted. Of course it was planted when I was ten years old, but I hadn't been paying attention to how tall it was growing all my life. Finally, I kicked a leg back at him like a horse and tried to free my arms. But he exercised a remarkable strength, pinning both my arms against the wall. It lasted less than a minute. He thought he pulled out in time, but I guess he didn't. In the morning, I washed my dress in his sink and left before he woke. I sped away in my car, and the first minute on the road, a bird flew into my windshield and remained there, orange, red, and blue, until hours later when I stopped for gas. The horrified attendant scraped it off while I bought lottery tickets. So I suppose Marfa was the thing that did it. In the wheelchair-accessible bathroom of the Ralphs, the test took a minute or so. Eleanor stared at it, and I stared at the ceiling. I was waiting for the sound of the gun. I knew what one sounded like now. Then there was an intake of breath, and the small noise of a dumb young kid. I looked down. I saw the plus sign, rendered in cornflower. Twenty-one. She put the wet pregnancy stick in the pocket of her shorts. She had no idea what to do. I suggested we go back to my house. In the car, she sat with the back of her head against the window and the gun pointed at my face. I scraped the doors of the Dodge against the branches of the dead trees that flanked the road back up the canyon. She flinched like it was an affront. I imagined a little cream bubble swimming in my blood. I imagined calling him up. Is this John Ford? Do you remember me from Marfa? I'm the woman that you held against a wall. I am fairly confident you didn't fuck anyone else on that trip, and I for certain did not. The reason I'm calling is that I'm pregnant with your child. Shall we raise it together? Are you in Virginia? Shall I come to you, or would you like to come here? I forgot what you do for a living, but there are lots of industries in Los Angeles. Slow down, Eleanor yelled. I hadn't been going over 25 miles an hour. At the top, I saw that Kevin's car was not there, but Alice's Prius was. I'd forgotten she was coming. Alice wasn't inside her car. She could have been walking around the place, down in the ravines. I didn't know what I would do when she found us. Whose car is that? Eleanor asked. My friend. You knew she was coming? I forgot. The events of this morning. I hope you might forgive me for forgetting. I saw Alice at the door of River's yurt. Then I saw River in the doorway. His arm was raised, his hand against the top frame of the door, right over her head. The nearness was unsettling. Get in the house, Eleanor hissed, before they see us. She's going to come and knock on my door because my car is here. What do you want me to do? Tell her I'm your friend. I felt Eleanor put the gun in her pocket. I called down to Alice. It was strange to say her name. Her head snapped up. She was startled. She ran up the ravine. I wasn't imagining the guilt. Its concentration was like a skunk smell in the air. River, nonplussed, 
waved and went back inside. Hey, she said. She was out of breath. She wore a red dress that could twirl. She was breathless and extra pretty. I smiled, trying to act normal. I was asking if he knew where you were. You know what's crazy is that I know River, from my yoga class. Small Canyon, I said. Alice turned toward Eleanor. Hi, she said, I'm Alice. This is my friend Eleanor, I said. I bought my car from her. She was the first person in L.A. who asked me how I was. Was Alice smart enough to know that Eleanor was Vic's daughter? I hadn't told her the girl's name. Nice to meet you, Eleanor. Joan and I were just about to go on a mini road trip. I was pregnant and standing before a young woman who wanted to kill me, and yet all I could think about was Alice inside River's doorframe, the way his arm was arched over her head. Eleanor seemed on the verge of tears. God, how she looked like her father, especially when her expression was one of pain. Vic was either jovial or in pain, but toward the end it was almost always pain, and then rage. Eleanor was infinitely more attractive than her father, but the night he killed himself, he looked better than he ever had. When Vic shot himself, all the servers stopped in their places like they were playing a game of freeze tag. His large body slid down the wall. A few droplets of blood got on our table, landing specifically in the folds of the buffalo mozzarella that Big Sky and I were sharing. It looked like a bit of berry compote. Every time we ate together, the food was perfect. The drinks were perfect. I had so much to give. His wife had scarves. So what? And that night, it had been so long since we'd seen each other. I could tell he missed me. More accurately, he had completely forgotten about me, and now, seeing me again, he was confused and captivated. I was distant. My dress was not revealing at all. In the past, I'd always dressed too seductively. But now I understood what a man like him wanted. I took a bite of buffalo just before Vic came in, and Big Sky watched me eat it like I was a curiosity. He watched me with his face in his palm, shaking his head. Who are you? He asked in that roping steer accent. It was the same question he'd asked me at the very beginning of us. But this time it had a positive connotation. I didn't smile. The cheese felt like chilled silk in my mouth. I was the loveliest I had ever looked. That was the moment I felt something good might happen to me. And that was the same moment Vic walked in. Oftentimes, I would see him in the streets, either the real him trailing me or the wraith of him I saw in every man with a comb over in a nice suit. For several months, I'd been worried he would kill me. My building had a small but well-appointed gym with woodways and the latest ellipticals. They all faced the giant bay window where you could look out at the glassy building shimmering in the sun. My back would be to the door, so I'd find myself turning around all the time. Each time I heard someone enter the room, I'd whip my head around to see if it was Vic. Now, here he was. The gun appeared like a magician's trick. The more I think of it, the more certain I am that it was for me. But he couldn't kill me and stay alive. He could not, in every sense, live without me. He said nothing. His eyes were wet. He smelled good and wore a pinstriped suit I'd never seen before. He looked at me in a way I'll never forget. Then he turned the gun to the side of his head, blinked, and pulled the trigger. Pink brain and sharp bits of skull went flying. Big Sky did not jump back. He held his arm in front of me like a gentleman. He tried to cover my eyes, but I wanted to look. I wanted to look at the next man who had come along to ruin my life. I wanted to see him bleed. I don't think Joan is going anymore, 
Eleanor said to Alice. Twenty-two. The night my father left us in the Poconos, my mother slept with her arms folded in an X across her chest, her hands gripping the opposite shoulders. She was protecting herself from everything, it seemed, including the blind, vole need of her only child. I was angry with her, but God, how I loved her. My need and hate were twins in my nervous belly. I stood in the doorway of her bedroom and watched her back and the digital clock that read 1147 in electric red. It felt like the latest and most terrifying hour. Maybe she knew I was in there. Little by little, I inched toward the bed. I can still recall the way I did it. There could be nothing worse in the world than being rejected by her, than her telling me I couldn't sleep beside her. It took perhaps three minutes for me to reach the bed. During that time, I concentrated on the ridges of stucco in the ceiling. I gasped when I spotted a spider web in one corner. I was shocked my mother had missed it. She didn't miss anything. She was the most diligent cleaner, the most observant woman in the world. I spent another few minutes working up the courage to lift the cover and press one knee on the mattress. Even then, I laid my weight down one teaspoon at a time. There was no way to do this perfectly. All of a sudden, she whipped around. I jumped back and nearly wet myself. What are you doing here, she said. I felt like something large and ungainly. My mother had the power to make me feel the opposite of a little girl. I said, Mommy, please. I'm certain that I begged. I always begged with her. I felt safe enough to beg. I knew she would always be my mother. It wasn't like the feeling I've had with some men, with ones like Big Sky, where I thought any sign of need on my part would send him running in the other direction. But I've since realized that such fears stemmed from nights like that one. Begging my mother, crying until I was heaving. But she stood her ground. I could not sleep with her that night. She wanted to be alone. And I needed to learn how to sleep by myself. Those were the reasons she gave. I couldn't argue with the latter. But the former burned a hole in me. When I close my eyes, I can call up the exact pitch of her voice. The way her accent formed the word alone. Alone. I was forced to slink back into my room, closest to the stairway. I lay on top of the covers, because I still harbored the hope that she would come for me, scoop me into her smooth mother arms and carry me to her bed, where we would cuddle and she would kiss my tears away. I would rear my butt back until it was tucked into the curve of her hips and thighs. She would hold me tighter than she ever had before. I lay on top of the covers for hours like that. I imagined my grandmother's rape. I imagined the man ripping her nude pantyhose off. I could hear her scream very clearly in my head. By that time, I was already obsessed with sex. It would only get worse. But by that evening in the Poconos, I was preoccupied with it. Only recently have I been able to trace it back to a fuzzy memory from when I was five or six. I was sleeping in my parents' bed, as I always did at that age. I had seen a movie about werewolves and was convinced they were going to come for me in my sleep. Every few months, my mother tried something. New bedsheets, even a new bed. But nothing could get me into my own room. This one night, they tried very hard. They began to prep me at dinner, over pastina, naturally. My mother made it sound like I would be disappointing her very much if I didn't at least try. And so I did. I tried for an hour, and when I finally fell asleep, I dreamed of a plush gray carpet in a room with a mirror, and I was looking in the mirror when suddenly the mirror cracked in half, and I saw a stripe of black blood across the carpet. I heard the howl of a wolf. I woke in terror and ran into their room. My mother held me and I fell asleep easily. Hours later, I woke again, this time to movement. 
It was a king-size bed, and sometimes I would wake up not knowing where my mother was. And if she was in the bathroom, I would wait restlessly until she returned. This time, she was not to my right, but she was on the bed. She was on my father's side, and he was moving on top of her. I turned slowly back to the other side of the bed and saw her bra and underwear and nightgown on the floor. I suppose I lay there until it was over, and I fell back asleep, but I can't remember. I blacked that part out. Though it definitely happened, my parents fucked in bed beside me. That night in the Poconos, my mother didn't care if I slept or not. My grandmother had been raped, and my father had gone home to be with her, perhaps to hunt the rapist in the streets of Orange, New Jersey. Yet there was something else my mother suspected my father of doing that was the reason he didn't take us with him. Now that I know most of the story, everything makes sense. All of that aside, I still don't understand why my mother wanted to be alone in her bed that night. Why my body beside her would be anything but helpful. To this day, it's the same chemical burn in my heart that I cannot cool. Twenty-three. The two women sat quietly at my kitchen table. I asked if anyone wanted an iced tea. I wondered if Alice could tell I was trembling or whether she'd noticed the way the girl was keeping her hands inside the pockets of her pullover. Eleanor, meanwhile, was projecting the same fearful rage that I'd witnessed so many times on her father's face. He would be angry at me for lying about something, some nascent love affair, but he wouldn't show it so he had to conceal it through clenched teeth. There was also the fear that I'd see through him, recognize his rage, and leave in disgust. Alice said that she would love a glass. At the beach that magnificent day, I told her I didn't think anything could grow inside of me. She touched my belly and said she was sure I was wrong. I said I didn't want anything to ever grow inside me. I had a miscarriage once, she told me. I didn't even know I was pregnant. I'd skipped two periods, but I was an idiot. My boyfriend was French. We were 15 at a hiking camp in the Dolomites. I told him, I think I'm having a miscarriage. He didn't know what to do, so he fell asleep. He didn't sleep on a sleeping bag or with a cover, and in the morning when it was over and I'd returned from washing myself in a creek, he told me he'd slept uncomfortably all night. That was his gift to me, his night of discomfort. Something came out of you? You don't have to look at it. I remember how badly I wanted my mother. Do you miss yours? No, I lied. I only wish my aunt were still around. Your aunt raised you? How did your parents die, Joan? Goja, yes, she raised me, or she let me raise myself. Tell me about her, Alice said. And happily, I described Goja to her, her smells and clothes and furs, her large black Mercedes, and how every time she spoke to me from her car phone, I would hear the seatbelt chime, and I would say, Goja, put on your seatbelt. And she would say in her heavy accent, Shut up. Tell me how you are feeling. I explained to Alice how it had been calming that Goja wasn't my mother, that I didn't have to care for her in that way, that I didn't have to know everything about her. There was no backstory through which I had to sift. Her own history only served as a lesson for me. She mined it when she had to give me advice. I thought of Goja then in my kitchen, what she would tell me to do, what mental strategy she would instruct me to employ. She always thought that anyone who hurt me should be punished severely. She wanted me to destroy Vic's life, tell his wife. I told her that he had children, and Goja said, I don't care about this man's children. You are child. Look at what he is doing to you. I'd seen pictures of Eleanor. I never wanted another child to hurt the way that I had. The truth is that even then, in my kitchen, I felt sorry for her. I didn't feel fear. 
The only fear I felt was that I would lose Alice. Already I had the premonition that Eleanor's presence would push Alice away. Eleanor was what my mother would have called a poor soul. She'd suffered so much. I couldn't decide which parent had been crueler to her. I thought of her little brother in the tub. The last moments of a child's life. I pictured him looking at his mother, the only thing in the world he knew to trust, looking at her wild eyes as she made that decision. It was easier for Eleanor to blame me than to blame her parents. I took the glass pitcher from the refrigerator. The fragrant mint leaves floated at the top. I selected three wine glasses by the stem and handled all of them with the skills I'd learned as a waitress at an all-glass restaurant on the marina in Jersey City. That terrible winter, I slept with two clients, one of whom, the married one, though I didn't know that at the time, asked if he could fuck me in the ass the very first night he came to my apartment. We had been fucking for barely five minutes when he asked. The next night, he came into the restaurant, this time with his wife. I lifted the rubber bar mat and poured the evening spillovers into his Long Island iced tea. Then I stirred it with a knife that had just deboned a raw chicken. Now I set the glasses on the table and filled Alice's cup first. As I did so, I saw out of the corner of my eye a blur of activity in Eleanor's lap. I thought she was going to shoot Alice. I thought of the time her father had me on all fours, going in and out of me, his hands lightly gripping my waist, not making any noises because he was too happy, too scared it would all end if he made an unpalatable move. I thought of his warm breath in my ear and the glee in his eyes. I thought of what he had done to his daughter and his wife. Eleanor, I said. I said it so calmly and sweetly that it shocked her, that she let the gun drop in her lap. Alice realized what had been about to happen, what might, in fact, still happen. She screamed, and then she began to cry. I had never seen someone look so beautiful while they cried. But it made her seem immature. It was such a stupid thing, to be afraid of a little girl with a gun that she didn't know how to use. Then Alice pitched forward and projectile vomited onto the girl's face. The stink was immediate and terrible. Eleanor stood and screamed and the gun dropped to the floor. The vomit, the color and texture of oatmeal, was in the girl's eyes, coating her eyelashes. It covered her entire nose and mouth, and as she was screaming, the vomit was seeping into her mouth. She tried to wipe the vomit from her eyes and crouched down, blindly grabbing for the gun on the floor. I picked it up like it was nothing and walked into the kitchen. I placed the gun behind the toaster and ran warm water and soaked a rag and came back and knelt beside the girl. I noticed then a gold locket around her neck. I didn't have to open it to know it contained a picture of her little brother, crudely cut into a circle. Oh, Eleanor, I said into her ear. Oh, you poor, poor thing. Twenty-four. Eleanor showered the vomit off. When she came out of the bathroom, she looked like the age that I was when I died. The gun hadn't been loaded after all. I didn't know what to do with it, so I put it inside my pot-bellied stove. I laid it across the crystals. When it became clear the girl was no longer a threat, Alice, in shock, went home. It hurt me that she did, but I acted like it didn't. That night, the girl and I spoke until the early morning. The guilt I felt was enormous. I did what I had to do. I told her the grand calamity of my childhood. As with her father before her, it bound her to me in a way that erased any hostility. There was no way to hear my story and still hate me. And like her father before her, she was going to keep me company. Alice, I knew, might abandon me at any point, but this girl would never. 
Over the next few weeks, she stayed with me. She never left. It happened slowly. Every day, I hoped it would end. She slept downstairs on the couch. My parents hadn't allowed sleepovers. They didn't think there was any reason for them. For someone to come into our home and in the morning go into our refrigerator for orange juice. They thought it was unseemly. I began to feel the same way, and the feeling only deepened over the years. Eleanor and I talked every night, late into the night. Sometimes I liked it, but mostly I felt like I couldn't breathe. It went on like that for so long that I lost track. Alice called or wrote every few days, and I told her the girl was still here. I could tell that she was appalled. Thankfully, I had a job. I could drop her off in Santa Monica or Zuma Beach and leave her there for the day. But the moment I clocked out, she expected me to collect her. I was in an emotional jail. Still, I owed it to this child not to turn her away. Turning her away would have been the same thing the world had done to me. I needed to be her Goja. But I couldn't face the notion that I might have to care for her indefinitely. I knew I would sooner kill her. Because sometimes it's better to kill someone than to leave them. One day behind her back, I called in sick to work. Eleanor, as though she knew, told me she didn't want to go anywhere. She was too depressed and wanted to stay in the house. I was terrified that she would hitchhike to the cafe and find that I wasn't there. But I had to take the risk because I felt I would otherwise lose Alice. I hated Alice for not wanting to be near the girl. That she thought of me differently now, as one half of a strange couple. Two hours later, I was in Alice's car, the air conditioning blasting wetly. We drove down Abbott Kinney looking for parking. She was taking me to a yoga class that she said would make everything better. Her hair was pulled up into a high, dark bun. She wore no makeup, and I wanted to kill her. But first I wanted to put her in a cage, fatten her up, feed her hormones and pig cheeks and Fanta, knock her teeth out and shave her eyebrows. I wanted her to die ugly. She told me she'd missed me, but she didn't apologize or explain why she hadn't been in touch. Every so often she would look at me, at my belly, and say, I cannot believe you're fucking pregnant. I was terrified that she would leave me. She asked me to tell her everything that had been going on, and I explained how I couldn't do anything just yet, how I had to let her stay. I didn't say how much I'd begun to feel for the girl, how she was a mirror of me. I couldn't yet tell Alice about what had happened in my tenth year. She might, at this too early stage, leave me for good. Abbott Kinney made me feel old. The girls on the sidewalk in their cowboy hats and the boys in their baseball caps and the skateboards and the surfboards on top of Volkswagens. If you were poor in Venice, you had to be beautiful. And if you were old, you had to be rich. Alice slipped her dusty Prius between two G-wagons. She was an excellent parker. She said she needed a coffee and led me up a ramp and through an alley to a line of people waiting outside a building that looked like a greenhouse garage. It had very high ceilings and bicycles on the walls and women with asymmetrical hair, men in red plaid shirts pouring hot water into Chemexes. We ordered our coffees and waited too long for them. So many men looked at Alice as we waited in line. Where is the little freak now? At home, the house. I tell her I'm going to work even when I'm not, and then I drop her off for excursions. Trancus Canyon, Encino, etc. She lets you leave the house? I laughed. Joan, why are you doing this? I feel bad for her. Just as you did for her father. No, this is different. She's probably in love with you. Please, I said. But I was grateful she considered me someone who could be loved. Let's go, she said. This class will reset your head. It might knock some sense into you. 
You might go home and tell the little barnacle to fuck off. The studio smelled of raw onions. The walls were lime green and the mats were threadbare rubber, even worse than the ones at the famous studio. Some yogis seemed to believe that the cheaper the yoga accoutrements, the better the practice. But this was different. At the head of the room, a rangy instructor pulled his Christly hair into a top knot. His lips were buttered with balm, his neck snaked with tendons. Alice and I took two places next to each other. Aside from the instructor, there was only one man, skinny, in long black shorts and a white tee. He adjusted his towel at the top corner of his mat. I felt sorry for him but didn't know why. Soon, others trickled in. The instructor dimmed the lights and it felt like evening. Dear friends, the instructor said, his voice quiet and meditative, but resounding all the same. I invite you to come into your bodies. Please take Vidrasana, kneeling pose, and ease yourself into the 47 corners of your frames. Melt your bones out to the recesses of your skin, but at the same time stay within the boundaries of your flesh. Good. Very good. Take a deep breath in. Now a deep breath out. Ah, excellent. Please go ahead and thank yourselves for coming into class tonight, for giving yourself this gift. We have a very wedded understanding of time in this room, don't we? And we appreciate that this hour is precious. This is a special class. We are a special group. And because we are unique in yoga, I thought we deserved a unique flow, our very own, this night. He slipped his eyes closed and pressed his hands in prayer. The room was still. I looked at Alice, but her eyes were closed too. When I was a boy, the instructor said, we used to hold these undercover seances. We'd turn off all the lights and repeat the names of our dead grandmas. Grandma Sue? Grandma Beth? A small collective laugh filled the room. You there, Grandma Joe? To our great relief, we never heard back from our dead Grammys. The last seance we ever held, one of us was trying to reach a dead parent. Our friend Bobby. His dad was a truck driver who died when his 18-wheeler flipped off a mountain pass in Idaho. Holy moly, how we all hoped he wouldn't come to us. Even Bobby. We couldn't fathom how far his dad had fallen, and we were terrified by the notion. If he spoke to us from beyond, we'd have probably pissed our dungarees. Looking back now, I realized that the purpose of those little seances was not to talk to these dead relatives, but rather to scare ourselves to death. Because wasn't that the scariest thought in the universe? Death? In the darkness, I saw the room nod. There were soft squeaking noises in the walls that I was sure were mice. Now, my friends, we have a unique gift in the world. All of us on this earth have a life sentence. We are walking around with an expiration date under our cap, but most of the people you see out there, bouncing around without a care in the world, they don't know when. They might live to 110. The way they act, it's like coffins are for vampires, am I right? Well... For those of us in the room, the sentence is a tad bit sooner than that, isn't it? And as I'm sure many of you have come to feel, there's a marvelous freedom in that. We are not scared of death. Not in the same way. Because from this point forward, we begin at death. Are you with me? Again, the room nodded. A Poland spring bottle crinkled. I heard the sound of water slipping down a throat. I used to hate the noise my father made when he smacked his thirsty lips to make moisture. He was a diabetic, and sometimes his mouth ran dry. So this evening, I'd like us to begin in Shavasana, corpse pose. May we, in yoga as in life, begin at death and travel onward from there. 
Now bring yourselves to lie down, release the legs, and push out through the heels. Soften the root of the tongue, the wings of the nose, and the taut flesh of the forehead. Let the eyes fall to the back of the head, then turn them downward to gaze at the heart. Release your heavy brain to the back of the skull. Once the room was lying down, Alice's hand found mine in the relative darkness, grasped it, and the instructor began to whisper. You are not your disease, dear friends. HIV AIDS does not define you. HIV AIDS are merely letters. You are not your body. Your body is a rental. As K. Patabi Joyce famously, exquisitely said, and soon it will be time to return your lease. You won't be penalized for the dents and the overage of miles. Instead, you will be given a brand new car, more beautiful than you could have ever imagined. And this one, my dear friends, will have the ability to fly. After the class was over, we walked outside and stood in the sun. The line where Alice's jaw met her neck was so beautiful as to be licentious. What the fuck, I said. When you're depressed or in grave trouble, she said, people think you should be near children, amusement. They invite you to dinner. They prop you up and shine their happy light in your face. It's bullshit. The opposite is true. You should seek out the dying. I felt there was something evil about that. Something evil in her. I asked her if she'd gone to HIV yoga before, and she said, of course, many times. She said she went to desperate places whenever she was feeling unfortunate. She liked to do her taxes on the quiet patio of the Beverly Hills Cancer Center, with its flushed jacaranda and its sterile herringbone bricks. Now I worried she was cruel and careless enough to leave me even after she knew who we were to each other. I wanted to stitch our bodies together. At a crowded restaurant, we ordered pâté on baguette and arugula with treviso from a girl with interstellar bangs. There was porridge on the menu and something called a risky biscuit. The font on the menu was old diner style. The slices of bread were tremendous, ash powdered, hard on the outside, cloud soft within. We sat out on the patio, arid with brown vines and piles of firewood. How far along are you, she asked. I have no idea. Are you going to keep it? I don't know, I said, even though I knew I would. She put her hand on my arm. Moments like those, I couldn't imagine she wouldn't love me. Why don't you go to the police? Tell them this child is a runaway. Have them send it back to its mother. I can't go to the police. Such an outlaw, Joan. Are you wanted in New York City? Are you the one who killed Vic? I just don't trust the police. Alice nodded and didn't ask me to clarify, but the police officer appeared to me then. There were two who came that night. One of them dealt with the bodies and the other dealt with me. He was in his early 30s with the pale, bloated face of a young boy that merely expands out at the sides as he ages. It took me a while to realize that he thought I'd done it. He wasn't intelligent. Even an hour later, when the trajectory of events became clear, he remained cold. He treated me as so many men in the future would. So tell your landlord, she said laughing. I'm sure it's another coda in the lease. She's a little girl, I said as I touched my stomach. You have your own child to protect. Are you a warrior, I want to know? Or are you some husk that men and now this girl have had their way with? After the words left her mouth, there was no trace of them on her face. I realized that no matter how much I'd told her, she didn't understand my life. Of course, I hadn't told her the end. Big Sky, in one of his pontificating moods, said it took 50 years for a death to be completely forgotten. 
but sometimes it took only two weeks. Some people, he said, were stronger than others. I realized in that very instant that I would never see Big Sky again. I would never see his face again. Feel his warm and reticent touch. Of all the rapes I'd sustained, this was the worst degradation. The way a man who thinks nothing of you can loom larger than your life and another life inside of you. That was the most awful thing. That, like my mother before me, I felt that my child was a burden. Twenty-five. Lenny met Eleanor one 103-degree afternoon. She was curled up on the couch when he knocked. I felt I was opening the door to a shameful secret. I introduced her as a friend who was staying with me. She was quiet and looked homely in a pair of inexpensive pajamas. For how long, he asked. I knew Lenny wanted to continue to unburden himself. I missed the jail of Lenny. How easily I could dip in and out of it. On top of that, my plan to pinch the watch was stalled. I don't know. A bit. There's a provision in the lease, no long-term guests. I knew that he was upset because he would not feel free to come and see me as often as he wished. Eleanor was not beautiful. If Alice had been staying with me, he would have been fine with it. He would have been more than fine. He would have been excited. She's not. She's staying for a few days. I was thrilled there was now an hourglass on her stay. In any case, Lenny said, trying to regain ground, I was coming to inform you that I have not received your August rent. It's August 12th. I have a 15-day leniency. Well, yes, but I'm informing you. Thank you. Belligerently, he turned and walked away. I can't leave, Eleanor said when the door closed behind him. At some point, I want to stay, she said, until the baby is born. You will be a part of its, his life. I promise you that. But, forever. Then I sickened myself. He's your brother, I said. She began to cry. She said she had nowhere else to go. She didn't want to go home. There was no home left. She asked me through her tears what her father had been like with me. Had he always been happy? I told her he talked about her all the time. In what way? He was very proud of you. When you learned how to drive, for example. How you parallel parked so well. She looked at me in that way all children do when hearing specific stories about how their parents felt about them. I'd had that look with Goja many times. But what about how he was with you? Was he always happy to be with you? Yes, I suppose. But he was also sad. Because you didn't love him back. Eleanor was sitting on the couch with her legs bent to one side. The pajamas were tight around her thighs and chest. She'd come to Los Angeles with $1,400, which in that city was barely enough for several dinners. At least it was barely enough for dinner the way that I ate dinner. The way that I racked up debt to cool my fever. I'd taken her to a giant discount clothing store in the valley. We shopped beside a mother with stringy blonde hair and twig legs in ripped jean shorts. Her child, a toddler with glorious green eyes, walked placidly beside her as the woman ranted into a flip phone, alternately cursing and crying. Eleanor and I were both greatly affected. We looked at each other, and I knew we felt the same way. We wanted to pick the child up and bundle her in our arms and whisk her away. We could not abide selfish parents. I bought Eleanor a pack of white briefs and several pairs of shorts and t-shirts, 
a yellow sundress that I'd seen her admiring. I bought her pajamas as well, but she wore mine nearly every night. He took it out on us because you didn't love him back. How did he do that? There were just nights he'd come home and he was depressed. He'd say something went wrong at work or when our grandpa, his dad, died. He said he was depressed about that for a really long time. Then he just started drinking a lot. Most nights he'd come home after Robbie was put to bed. A couple of times I heard my mom ask him to go in and kiss him goodnight, and my dad would say he did. But I knew he didn't. Vic never told me about his father's death. I really don't know how to tell you how sorry I am. Sometimes I hate you so much. Other times, I think it's not your fault. Like that stuff my dad wanted, you, whatever. He wouldn't have done what he did if it wasn't for how miserable he was at home. He was unhappy. I guess he always was when I think back. He never loved my mom. I mean, he cared for her like you care for anyone you live with or anyone who loves you. But he didn't love, love her. And after Robbie. I took her hand in mine. I didn't want to, but felt I needed to. Before Robbie, he came to my softball games. Every single one. He wore a dumb, proud dad hat or whatever. We played catch every day after school. We made meatball sandwiches at night after mom went to bed. I knew he wasn't totally happy, but he was happy with me. I walked to my little tin and brought out three one milligram Xanax pills. I walked to my little tin and brought out three one milligram Xanax pills. I swallowed two dry and offered her the third. Perhaps it was irresponsible of me, but I didn't see any reason for someone in her kind of pain not to take pills. She took it from me. She had never done any kind of drug, had never smoked a cigarette. She told me she was a virgin, that she thought she would wait until marriage. And now she didn't want anything. In one day, she told me, she'd gone from wanting a love story for herself to not believing in love at all. What about God, I asked. What about him? Do you still believe in God? Of course, she said, don't you? No, I don't. That's weird to me. That's kind of totally nuts. Why? Because how else are you going to see your parents again? Twenty-six. I'd been writing to Alice for two weeks, and she would write back sometimes an entire day later. Her replies would be friendly but distant. They were the sorts of replies I'd gotten from Big Sky toward the end. It made me remember the way all my female friendships had exasperated me. I realized that was how Alice now felt about me. It was hard to believe— in the past, if a woman didn't immediately hate me, then she would eventually develop an unsavory need for me. There was Carly from college, whom I reconnected with during a dark spell in between lovers. On my way back across the country, I stopped to see her, and we spent a week pretending we were better friends than we'd been in school. We ate pressed sushi and read the same biography of Jackie Onassis on Butterfly Beach. She wanted me to sleep in her bed, but I took the couch every night, peppery with sand. She had a crush on the bartender at the sushi place. That was what made him attractive to me. He was good-looking, but not tall and not clean. She introduced me to him at a party. When she went to tap the keg, I let him bring me to a filthy couch with a bedsheet over it where we kissed. I wasn't even a little drunk. I felt someone poking my arm and looked up to see it was Carly, rage and disbelief on her face. She downed her drink. The cranberry froth clung to the fine hairs on her upper lip. I'm going home, she said, waiting for me to follow. I'm not finished with you yet, 
the young man whispered into my ear, gravelly like a junkie. I was disgusted and humiliated. With the last spittle of my inheritance, I got a bungalow at the Four Seasons in Santa Barbara. I drove us there in my rented car, leaving Carly to cab home. We didn't fuck. I was too afraid he might carry disease. I half-heartedly blew him and let him finish on my chest. I remember the color was a terrible greenish hue. In the morning, I called my friend. I didn't apologize, but asked her to come to the pool. She was over in a flash. It was one of those pools that impresses people. Olympic and clean with coral grounds and white umbrellas and the private beach just below. I found it depressing and wished it were half the size. We ordered mimosas and shared a club sandwich. But eventually Carly couldn't take it. She wanted more from me and tried to pick at my insides to get it. She didn't know anything about my history. Nobody did besides Goja and later Vic. But anyhow turned to me with a piece of sandwich in her mouth and said, are you the way that you are because of your mom or your dad? I stood up. I was 26 and wearing a red bikini. My body was at its peak, the best it would ever look. Without another word, I walked back to my room, my rear swinging, polo-shirted pool boys watching, packed up my car and left town. I slurped some Bell and Oysters at a harbor bar on the way out because I'd already spent so much in one weekend that it didn't seem to matter. I never spoke to Carly again. I often wonder how she thought of that day. How long she hung by the pool after I'd left, expecting me to return. She'd become marvelously invested in me within mere days. Had it been me? Had I been the one who was left? I'd have lain on that chaise through dusk. I'd have sucked the day down to its bone. But now I was the jealous friend. I couldn't even go back and look at our messages because my need was so shameful to me. The most recent one. I am eating cilantro and thinking of you. She didn't reply for hours and then asked me if I'd ever been to the Santa Monica Pier, and I said that I hadn't. By bringing me to that place, thick with tourists, their lips stained and slurpy, their rotten children running wild, I knew it meant she was going to leave me for good. I didn't know exactly why, but I was sure of it all the same. We ate chili dogs and drank lime rickies and headed for the Ferris wheel. She led me up the steel stairs of the ride, treating me like I was a dog and my arm was the leash. She was much taller than I, and even though she was slender, her bones took up a lot of space. Her hips were like my mother's. I can't be sure because it's been so long, but my memory is that my mother's hips were very wide. I pictured Alice on my father's arm, not as his daughter, but as his lover. I reveled in that feeling of her holding my arm. I hadn't loved a woman's touch that much since my mother. I worried that when Alice left me, I would go looking for her forever. Once, I followed Big Sky. I waited outside of his office building on Wall Street for an hour until he finally emerged, laughing with a well-dressed woman. Was he fucking her? No, probably not. But from afar, it appeared they had that flirtation, the one we'd had at the magical start. I followed them to the nicest lunch spot in the area. I watched from the window as they ate. Frise. Bald black olives. They each drank a glass of red. Vic had followed me like that, probably more times than I could even imagine. In his two large suits, his teeth gritted behind his thin lips. Alice and I sat across from each other inside one of the cups of the wheel. The steel clanked with a risky noise as the wheel began to turn. I miss you, Alice said, but it didn't sound genuine. Eleanor is going to leave soon. Good. 
I wanted to know why it bothered her so much, why I wasn't enough on my own, even with this barnacle on my back. Hadn't we hit it off perfectly? Didn't she realize our bond was deeper than a new friendship? She's much younger looking than I expected and built like a circus strongman. She's a little girl, I said. Joan, you don't need to take care of her. Tell her you're going on a trip. Tell her you're going to see her parents. She knows I don't have any, I said, thinking how strange it was that Eleanor knew my secret and Alice did not. Well, for God's sake, you two sit up talking all night? You don't think this is a bit fucked? Her father just killed himself, I said. Her mother is shattered. She had a brother with Downs. You didn't tell me that, she said. I thought I did. What does it matter? It matters a lot. That's a big thing. Why? What do you mean, why? Did Vic agree to have a child with Down? I wonder. I don't think he did. She kept it from him? She knew there was a one in three chance or something, and yes, she kept that from him. Let me ask you something. Can you imagine what it was like for the child growing up as the only child her father could love? I have a second cousin with Down syndrome, in Marema. It's better there. Roman Catholics are more about the heart and less about the way something should look. I'm not religious, you know. But if both parents are the type to love whatever form something takes, then fine. Then you take the kid to the market, and you don't give a flying fuck who looks at him three times. But if you are a man like your Vic, who is upwardly mobile, who is more intelligent than the family he came from, than his wife who he married too soon, who got a taste of a woman like you, can you imagine the rage you'd feel? And now his daughter there, she knows that you were the reason her father stopped trying to get it up for his family. He met you and became even more withdrawn. Jesus Christ, it's more than just her father cheated and now she wants to kill the slut who fucked her dad. It's she wants to kill the slut who made her family seem like a pile of garbage. It's not your fault, Joan, but this is worse than I thought. I can't believe you didn't tell me about the boy. That girl will never leave you. I told her it was worse than that. I told her the boy was dead and about the way it happened. Alice looked at me like I was the one who'd killed the child. Almost all of them, Joan. Someone else's men. Fuck you. It's weird. You don't get me. You're a fucking trope. There's nothing more to get. I felt my cheeks sinking, my mouth parting. She could barely look at me because she knew how much she was hurting me. She said she should be getting home, and I tried to say I would take a taxi, but I wanted to be right beside her at the cost of my dignity. I thought of Eleanor at home. She'd be waiting for me with her crab pincers, just as her father had. Alice and I made up, sort of. She apologized. On the way back up the canyon, she told me she was thinking of going on a yoga retreat to a place called Feathered Pipe that she needed to get out of Los Angeles. August in Los Angeles was for the birds, she said, as though I weren't going to be there. Several weeks earlier, we might have been going away together. It wasn't until I was about to get out of the car that I asked her where the retreat was. She picked up her big cat-eye sunglasses from the dirty console and put them on. She smiled in a way I would never forget. Montana, she said. Then she winked and pulled away before I'd even closed the door. Killing becomes something that isn't outlandish. When you've seen what I have, a number of awful things become practical. Twenty-seven. I got Eleanor a job at the cafe working half my hours so that when she was gone, I was at home, and vice versa. 
She wasn't exactly happy with the arrangement, but at the same time she knew she had to contribute. It'd been over three weeks by that point. I spent my evenings cooking for the two of us, like we were a married couple. I increased her dose of Xanax to a full milligram so that she would fall asleep early. I laid a blanket over her body on the couch. She didn't shower every day, so sometimes she smelled of onions, and I did a load of laundry nightly while she observed me from the couch or watched mindless television, reruns of old shows about high schoolers. I folded her clothes like I was her mother. One night, we sat on the couch together and watched an old film my mother used to love, The Major and the Minor. I took in only art that wouldn't fell me. I watched only romantic comedies and read books only about subjects that didn't mirror anything in my own life. On the coffee table, my phone began to buzz. Nobody called anymore. I reached for the phone, hoping it might be Alice, even Big Sky, though that was a ludicrous idea. I prayed to my parents for it to be the man I thought I loved. But before I could pick up the phone, the ringing stopped and a message came through. Is my daughter there? Tell me if she is, tell me her name is Eleanor. I showed the message to Eleanor, who looked utterly nonplussed. Don't you think you should call her, I asked. She's lucky I don't call the police, she said. I understand, but she's been through a lot. It's her fucking fault, all of it. Will you please block her number? I blocked the number and we sat on the couch and drank our tea and took our drugs. And Eleanor passed out and I watched the movie straight through to the end. Once it had reached the one-month mark, I thought about killing her. It got to the point that there was nobody I didn't want to kill. I was finally showing, and even though I tried to cover it up with loose dresses, I could see Eleanor staring at my belly, co-opting it with her eyes. I felt bonded to my child. I didn't need anyone anymore. I was throwing up every morning. I would do it outside like an animal to avoid Eleanor waking too soon and stealing my morning hours. I wanted to kill everyone. One day River came by, acting as though we'd never fucked. I opened the door to his knock and shut it quickly behind me so that he wouldn't see Eleanor inside. She was having one of her spells during which she cried and shook on the floor, the same as the ones I'd had. I watched her during these spells. From several feet away, I said comforting things. I never touched her, even though I knew how badly she wanted me to. River stood in a white tee and cargo shorts, his blonde hair catching the sunlight. Kurt was with him. The day was bright, but not hot. They were going on a hike, and River asked if I wanted to come. I pictured us high up on the mountain on one of those dry trails, fucking amid the monkey flower, my back getting scratched by the ragweed. I imagined it would turn him on to know I was pregnant. It turned me on. It also made me feel hopeful that I might pretend the child inside of me was Rivers and not the man in Marfa's. I was about to say yes. I was about to say I would just run inside and get my boots when the door opened. There stood Eleanor, her face a mess. Oh, River said, you have company. This is Eleanor, I said, about to cry. Oh, hey, he said, extending his strong arm. She looked jealous. She lightly took my arm. I felt her pulling me inside. I felt the threat and the pain in her touch. Maybe some other time, he said, smiling as though he'd seen something untoward, something a little gross. I nodded and smiled and told him to have fun and closed the door. That's the guy who lives in the circus tent? The yurt, I said, feeling faint. She asked me if we could go for a walk, just the two of us. She was crying. I began to cry too. Following our day at the pier, I heard from Alice even more sparingly, twice a week at most. I considered going to one of her classes, but shame stopped me. I missed her like I hadn't missed anyone since Goja. 
I understood I'd become a seedy figure to her, but I couldn't accept that Eleanor's presence was the end of Alice and me. Then one afternoon, one of those perfect days that can make you feel lonely, I heard the light engine of a car, but it never came up the hill. It parked at the bottom, almost inside the start of the trail under a tree that would scrape its hood. The car was Alice's Prius. My heart leaped. Thankfully, Eleanor was at work. I watched out my window and saw Alice's long legs in a pair of tiny spandex yoga shorts climbing the hill, crossing the big ravine until she was out of my eyeline. From the window, I couldn't see the door of River's yurt. When I found the courage to step outside, I saw no one. She hadn't come for me. Back inside, I waited, trembling for several hours. I thought to leave the house, but I needed to see her, to confirm where she'd been. At dusk, when I saw her finally descend the hill, I noticed that her previously ponytailed hair was undone. I left to pick up Eleanor from work. Alice's car was now at the studio. She taught a 7 p.m. Ashtanga class. Over the next two weeks, as my stomach grew and Eleanor's need expanded throughout the house, stifling me more than the heat ever could, I observed Alice come to River's yurt six times in total. There may have been more visits while I was at work. The first time she stayed overnight, I vomited into the toilet of the tiny bathroom where the smell of Eleanor's menstrual blood filled the air. I'd bought her dog waste bags and told her to triple bag her large, thick pads. But, like the child that she was, she forgot. I was devastated, jealous on many levels. For one, the fact that they seemed to never go on dates, leave the house, like all each wanted and needed was the other's young and perfect body. I couldn't get it out of my head that it could have been me in there with him had Eleanor not blocked me that time he came to my door. That, even though he was immature, his body and his energy were a great salve. But more than anything, I was crushed that Alice had left me so cruelly and substituted this boy for me. The feeling of wanting to be her, of wanting to possess her body and her strength, but mostly her past, intensified to a point where I couldn't bear it. I felt again the urge to kill her, to kill myself. I knew I was going to kill something. What had begun to torture me most was the idea that she didn't care that I saw her. Yes, she parked down below, hidden partly by trees, but it was a half-assed gesture. The fifth week of Eleanor's stay and Alice's withdrawal from my life, I made a decision. I returned home from work and cut Lenny off at the pass as he approached. He asked about Eleanor, and I told him she had a bad cold. I told him I was feeling ill, too, and I didn't want to give him something that might lead to pneumonia. He asked me if I hated him. There is no need to tell people you hate them. No need to confront them. I would advise you to lie in wait until you take your revenge. But he placed his hand on my arm softly. The expression on his face was plaintive. Joan, he said, I have been waiting to finish my story. I noticed he was wearing the watch. I tried not to look at it. I told him to wait a moment, then I went inside to get a carafe of water. I told Eleanor to stay. She hated it when I did that. She hated to feel separate from me. I returned to Lenny. It served me to know more. Thank you, Joan. There isn't anyone else. It was a role I was used to, last woman standing. Lenny poured himself some more vodka. I placed my hand over my glass with fanned fingers as my mother used to do. Lenny placed the vodka down. Go on. I remember where you left off. I was appalled. After that day, he continued. I was filled with self-recrimination. The rage had cooled, and in its place an awesome guilt took root. Lenore had grown despondent over the most recent failed conception. I refused to take responsibility. I didn't say a word. 
Like a child, I sulked. It was the summer with nothing to do. I reread Goodbye Columbus in the cafe where you work. I ate anchovy fillets from the can. That day at Sandstone, I'd been as ugly as I think anyone can be. I'd taken the love of this beautiful woman and just... He made a crushing motion with both hands. Several times I walked onto the beach at night toward the rolling ocean. I never believed in God, but I asked the ocean, the universe, to take me, to swallow me whole. I laid myself down at the shoreline, but it turned out the ocean didn't want me. The white man's burden, I said. I'm sorry? You're a white, wealthy male. Once you were a young, white, wealthy, entitled piece of shit. Now you are old and you have the diseases you should have. He nodded. He appeared suddenly chastened. Yes, I know, Joan, I understand. And I'm telling you this terrible thing I did, not to absolve myself, but to sacrifice the last thing I can. I nodded, but my rage was so intense at that moment, I imagined it issuing from me in a bear-shaped vapor and killing the man. It was the female rage that builds for decades. I thought of the day I watched two skinny teenage boys playing ping pong in the rec room of the hotel where I cleaned. I watched as another cleaning woman, Anna, heavy with four children and a broken back, vacuumed the floor. The ping pong ball jumped off the table and rolled into the mouth of Anna's industrial vacuum. I saw how she hadn't gone for the ball, but neither did she veer away from it, and the ball was swallowed by the vac, and the young boys swore. She turned the vacuum off just in time to hear one boy cry out, Fuck, the fucking ball. The other said, Give it back. And Anna sneered. Your little ball is gone, she said. And she turned the vacuum back on, a poltergeist of light and noise. Anna needed that job, but she would have lost it that day if she had to. The facts, Leonard said obediently. I took Lenore back to Sandstone to punish myself. It was late August and there was a party at the ranch. I bought her a dress that was nothing but a swath of purple silk, and she tied it like a toga over one shoulder. She had long, thick legs like a Clydesdale. I wore a tuxedo. Most people were clothed that night. Some, of course, were not. There was a band playing on a strange little stage in the main room. Dr. Johnson. Oh, I said, and Leonard nodded at me. And we watched them and danced. Lenore was easily the most gorgeous woman in the room. The lead singer of the band was eyeing her. He was effectively singing to her and her alone. Halfway through a dance, someone came up to us, a bearded man, oily and tanned, and he handed us both a pill. Back then we called it a Mickey. Within 30 minutes, Lenore and I were both reeling. She went to the bathroom and I thought to accompany her, but then some red-haired bimbo came and intercepted me. She had tassels on her tits. I'll never forget the way they swirled. And in my brain, the drug was dancing. The red-haired woman sat me down on a couch and sat on my lap just staring into my eyes and kissing my eyelids every so often. It was a divine feeling. I felt helpless and delicious. Finally, I found the strength to get up. I pushed her off of me and went to look for Lenore. The band was not playing, and this struck me as ominous. I passed many rooms where people fucked, groups of four and five. One room was just a chain of cunnilingus, woman on woman on woman, and at the head was one man fucking one woman. I stopped and watched several rooms until finally I saw a sight that shot me down. Lenore's purple swath of silk on the floor. This was in the doorway of a large room, and the door was open because that was the rule at Sandstone. Open doors, open hearts. Whatever nonsense. Lenore was on the bed, naked. Beside her was the lead singer of the band, the man you must have met already, stroking her side, kissing her nipples. Many times I've thought to kill him, but I'm a goddamned coward. He was much younger than me, than both of us, about 20 years. 
My head was spinning. I had no words. He looked at me. He said, hello, my friend. Lenore fluttered her eyes as he entered her. She looked at me and held out her hand, and I took it. I was shaking, crying, but she smiled at me as though it were me entering her. It went on for ten minutes, but God knows it felt like a century, with me watching and sobbing like a child, getting all that I deserved. He kept going until he orgasmed, and she came along with him. I'd never seen her climax so hard. Afterward, they lay there, the two of them, spent. Jesus, I said. I was trembling all over. The next morning, we both woke with terrible hangovers and started to rework it in our brains that she was raped. Not violently, but that she was taken advantage of while under the influence of a very powerful drug, and I had come to the room too late to stop it. That was our story. In a sense, it was the truth. He coughed. I looked at the thick blue veins on his wrist, the watch twinkling across them. I am sure, Leonard said, you can guess what comes next. In fact, I had no idea what came next. Weeks passed. She took one of the home tests. She already knew because her breasts ached. Her mouth was full of spit. She couldn't hide her happiness. That was the hell. He began to shake. We could have pretended it was mine. No one would have questioned it. It was the happiness in her that I couldn't take. The happiness that someone else had put there. And so we decided, and yet we never discussed it out loud. I said, let Dr. Menta see you. She knew only a bit about Dr. Menta, but it was enough. All right, she said. She said she would drive herself to the appointment. She would get a drink first at the Beverly Hills Hotel and wanted to be alone. I paced the house all that day. I couldn't read or eat. The day was overcast. I pictured her driving through the fog down the canyon. Part of me hoped for a car accident, something absolving. She came back late, past nine. Darling, you said, did you do it? You didn't, and that's all right. Yes, I said exactly that. I believe. How did you? Go on, finish, I said, surprised that men always seemed not to know it when you hated them. She didn't do it, and I told her it was all right, and she cried out in gratitude. She wanted a child at any cost. She wanted that child, I said, because she already knew who it was. Perhaps, he said, stroking his waddle. You did something. Yes, I did something terrible. I shook my head back and forth, vibrating with wrath. This canyon is full of the types, you know, their pebbles and sands and crystals. The Bulgarian at the dry cleaner whom I'd known for years. Her breath you could smell from ten feet away, as though she ate bugs and dirt. One morning, along with my pressed shirts, she handed me a little brown sack, and inside were two vials, one of black cohosh and one of blue. You old sick fuck. You know what they do? I knew. In the hospital once, a woman had tried to induce labor with blue cohosh. She'd been ten days past her due date, and she could no longer tolerate the heartburn but she was allergic to cohosh. She died during the emergency cesarean. I spent most of the night outside the nursery watching her baby, who had a full head of rich black hair. That night I made Lenore her tea, Lenny continued, only it was steeped in triple the recommended dosage of both. She had no idea. No, I believe she had some idea. And she bled. She bled so much I was afraid she would die. It started in the middle of the night. The coyotes began to circle and howl, and then the contractions began, and after an hour of screaming and pain, it came out of her, a seahorse shape, blue and red. She held it to her breast gently and kissed its alien skull. Even in my fear and guilt, I felt the rage. 
another man's seed at Lenore's breast. Within seconds, the thing died. I nodded. I'd made my decision. But I wouldn't give him the slightest of hints. I smiled. I patted the wrist that wasn't wearing the watch. There, I said. Do you feel better now? He nodded. Hideously, he was grateful. Thank you, Joan. Go home, take a nap. Somewhere in heaven, Lenore is smiling. I took his arm roughly, pushed him in the direction of his tiny home, then turned and opened my door. Of course, he made an attempt to follow me, so I quickly shut the door in his face and returned inside, rageful, only to find Eleanor wearing my white slip dress. It was straining at her chest. I couldn't believe it. Eleanor, what the fuck? What, she asked. She was existentially frightened of me. That's my special dress, I said. Oh, I didn't know. Sorry. It's my mother's. Please take it off. She pulled it off. Underneath, she wore her cheap underwear and bra. I'm really sorry. I boiled water for tea, and she walked to the area on the floor where she kept her things. She dressed in her own clothes, and then, with a smile on her face, something I'd never seen, told me that she felt okay that day, for the first time since her brother's passing. I told her how happy I was to hear that, and truly, I was. And I'm grateful to you for getting me the job and for letting me stay here. I wanted to say that I'd never agreed that she'd come and never left. Instead, I nodded kindly. And I forgive you. Involuntarily, tears filled my eyes. Yeah, and I wanted to tell you. I feel good having you in my life. I know that sounds weird. No, I get it. Also, I'm really excited about the baby. It's getting closer, and maybe that's why. I don't want to be creepy or whatever, but I love him already. I nearly spilled the hot water on my legs. I turned from her and crushed three Xanax between my fingers and dropped them into her cup. Here, I made some tea. She never refused anything I made her. I thought of all the times I'd cooked for her father, his fawning gratitude, the careful way that he chewed. She smiled as she took it from me, and 30 minutes later, she was passed out on the couch. I sprayed down the white slip with Big Sky's cologne to mask Eleanor's sweat and walked to River's door. For many years, my rage was dormant. I'd lived to survive. I could call up the hideous event, but in a far-off way. I could have dictated only the facts. I could not have called up each moment of horror. Back then, not a second went by that I didn't feel like something was eating my heart. But in the canyon, the pain turned to rage, and the rage was growing around me, the way the sun-baked bougainvillea grew around the old swingers' mansion. I'd never fucked a man to get back at a woman. I'd flirted with the boyfriend of a friend to check my power, though only after the friend had hurt me, had flaunted some faux happiness in my face to make herself feel better. This was new. Alice had not theoretically done anything to hurt me. She'd removed herself from my life, but not out of spite. She simply didn't want to be near me. That's the most awful thing someone you love can do. I knocked on River's door. He opened it shirtless. I told him my air conditioning had broken and that I couldn't stand the heat. I asked if he had anything cold in his fridge to drink. I had nothing in mine. Yeah, of course, come in, he said. His bed was unmade and Kurt was lying on top of it. Is beer okay? I nodded and he pushed lime halves into two bottles of Corona with his calloused thumb. He said cheers. We clinked the glass and his thick pink lips covered the whole mouth of the bottle. So that girl, is she like a friend? 
She's the little sister of my good friend back in New York. Their dad just died and she came out here to get away. That's why I came out here too. Is your mom still in Nebraska? Yeah, but she's good. She's seeing this dude. He's a good guy. I'm happy for her. That's good. Yeah, it's pretty great. The last time I was in here, I said, sitting down on his bed and stroking the dog's head. He laughed nervously. The thing with Alice was apparently becoming serious. I understood that he felt guilty and that if I referenced our intimacy, he would pull away. The last time I was in here, Kurt wasn't. Oh, yeah, he said. He was grateful I didn't say anything else. I also knew that would make him want me more, the notion that I might have forgotten the way he made love. I crossed and uncrossed my legs. The dress made a V-shape between my thighs, a gleaming silk triangle. It was impossible for him to avert his eyes. I drank half the bottle. I could feel the heat growing between us. I wish there was a pool or something, I said. Do you know the song Night Swimming? Fuck yeah, that's a great song. I'll play it. That'd be great. He played the song. I lay down on his bed and cuddled with Kurt and swayed my bent legs left and right to the music. The dog was a very good dog. He liked to lie against a warm human body, but he wasn't needy. He didn't smell or shed. He was smart and loyal. He never left Riverside, even when they were mountain running. I'd never known a dog that good. I thought how lucky Alice was to have a kind and good-looking boyfriend with a perfect dog. The fact she was able to have that was because of the particular love she'd been given by her single mother. I believed that with my whole heart. By the end of the song, River was lying beside me, and our legs were interwoven. We kissed like high schoolers for nearly half an hour before I leaned into his ear and told him to please put it everywhere. Twenty-eight. I feel sick, Eleanor said the next day, when finally she woke from her drugged slumber. What time is it? It's noon. Maybe you have the flu. It's going around. I missed work. I called in for you. Steve opened. You can go in now. Or I can if you don't feel well. I wish you could just stay home. One of us has to work. She nodded and got up. She pulled her hair back and walked groggily to the door. You're not going to shower? I'll shower later. She walked out of the door in a way that recalled all the times I'd walked out of Big Sky's door when his wife was at their country house in the Hudson Valley or at the cabin in Montana. I walked out with the fear that he was glad I was leaving, the fear that I might never see him again. Big Sky and his wife lived at the Montana house most of the time now, and when I found out the location of Alice's retreat, I began to pick at the skin on my deformed thumb. My father had deformed me. I'd had a wart on the finger, and my father had picked up my thumb and turned it. He said that warts did not go away with the creams I was using, and he brought out a little laser, like a creme brulee flare, and burned half of my thumb off. But the wart was also gone. I went to rip off little pieces of skin that grew over the deformity. I looked at a map of Montana. The retreat was less than a half hour from Big Fork, from their six-bedroom lodge on Flathead Lake, with the kayaks and the water skis tied to a giant oak that grew out of the water. There was a grand main residence with all local woodwork, with stone showers, and with a kitchen that made my chest hurt. And then there was a small but gorgeously appointed cabin on stilts over the water, where he sometimes slept alone to hear the lapping of the lake against the pebbles he'd had specially imported from a place in Sandpoint, Idaho. In the beginning, he told me he slept in the lake house to think unmolested of me. And I would picture him staring up at the log ceiling, stroking himself, and wishing I were there. I had told Alice where the house was. 
I'd pulled it up on my phone, the old listing with the photos I'd studied as though there would be a test about my former lover's real life. I'd told her about the grocery store where he bought his big cuts of beef. It's no organic market, he'd said, but they know their ribs. Johnny, the meat guy, he knows his ribs. It was the next day when River knocked on my door. I'd never seen him look sad. What's wrong? I told her. I told Alice. You told her what? About what we did. Oh. Yeah, it's terrible. Why did you tell her? Because I couldn't live like that. I pretty much love her. Why are you telling me? Because you're friends. Not really anymore, I said. I felt faint, and I didn't think it was from the pregnancy. I heard my burden come to the door. May I have a moment? I hissed at Eleanor. It was the first time I'd snapped at her. I went outside and closed the door behind me. She's really upset. I think she hates me. Well, you cheated on her. He looked like he was about to cry. She's leaving for her retreat in a few days. She said she'd think about whether she could forgive me. But either way, she wasn't going to be exclusive with me for a while. Why are you telling me this? I don't know, he said. I have no one else to tell. So go tell your dog, I said. I walked back inside my house and slammed the door. I wrote her that day. I didn't know about the two of you. Predictably, there was no reply. I felt remorse, but not really. Mostly, I felt fear. I closed my eyes and saw her at the Whitefish Farmer's Market, carrying a baguette and a bouquet of poppies. Big Sky would be coming from the opposite direction with a brown bag of tomatoes and basil. Then the pink fucking. And all I had was this lump of a child on my couch. I kept checking my phone for a reply. Alice would know I'd be doing that. I'd told her all the sad things I did. I took Eleanor to the place that Alice was supposed to take me, Cold Spring Tavern, a former stagecoach stop up in San Marcos Pass. We drove until we found an ivy-covered wooden house on a main road set in the woods. Dark smoke rose from the chimney through the tall trees. You couldn't see the sky. There were old wooden picnic tables and a bearded man flipping big red steaks on a charcoal grill. Motorcycles were parked in diagonal formation as far as the eye could see. It was so romantic inside the place that I wanted to kill myself. Red-checked tablecloths, oppressive candles, dusty Tiffany lamps, mounted deer busts. The first thought I had was how I wished to be there with Big Sky, how I wished to dance with him in the middle of the afternoon, to fuck in the woods behind the bar or in the charming, slightly scummy inn down the street. I felt crazy, I have to tell you, the craziest I have ever felt. I had to stifle my laughter. Eleanor would say something serious and I'd laugh and laugh, the kind of laugh where the whole body moves like a rung bell. She looked at me oddly, but then she would smile, too. Everybody just wants to be happy. We sat inside and ordered a couple of lagers and the tri-tip steak sandwiches. When the bartender dropped off the beer, I smelled expensive marijuana on his breath. Eleanor was wearing a t-shirt with a palm tree on it and a pair of khaki shorts that fit too tight around her thighs. This is the coolest place I've been, she said. She was given to saying things like that without the corresponding expression of happiness on her face. I agreed that it was. Thank you for bringing me here. Well, I think we both were having some cabin fever. Do you like that guy who lives in the yurt? We had sex a couple of times. He's good in bed. Those words looked like they'd hurt her. Can you do that, she asked. What do you mean, I asked, laughing but annoyed. Like when you're pregnant. Sometimes I would forget I was pregnant, and anyhow I couldn't believe a child would linger in there. 
I was sure that at any moment my body would dispel it. I told her, of course you can. The penis doesn't, like, poke the baby? No, Eleanor. Anyway, he didn't put it in that hole. Predictably, this shocked her. She tried not to show it. She tried to pretend she was mature. So you like him? Do you like being a virgin? She shrugged, taking a sip of her beer. The sandwiches arrived, sloppy and beautiful, with apple horseradish on the side. We ate them without speaking. She wiped up steak blood with the crust of the bread. I never finished all my food. My mother told me to always leave a little bit on the plate. Once we were done, we walked outside with fresh beers and sat on the logs, and the motorcycle men stared at me, the kind of staring that never stopped. I had the deplorable thought that I wanted one of them, the largest one, to fuck the baby out of me. I'm worried about sex, Eleanor said. Honestly, it's nothing. I mean that I don't know who I am. In what way? Very quietly, she told me that sometimes she felt like a girl who liked women, and other times she felt like a boy who liked women, and still other times she felt like something in between who just wanted to be loved, that it was a painful feeling, that she walked around with it all the time, hanging from her neck. I asked her if her mother knew, and she laughed, and I asked her if her father had suspected it. He had mentioned to me once or twice that he was safe for the time being, since Eleanor did not seem interested in boys, so he did not need a shotgun for date nights. He was always acting the part of the insanely protective father, because that was what I missed about mine. I had to confront what protective meant, whether I had, in fact, been protected. Physically protective was one thing. Any father could own a shotgun. Before she could answer, one of the motorcycle men came over and leaned down between us, his hands on the log table, his arms too close to us both. What's cooking, ladies? I saw the rape in his eyes. I was wearing my white dress and laughed to myself thinking how anyone would say I kept asking for it. I'd opined often with other women and with men that every man has a degree of rape in him. Women didn't understand what I meant. They were alternately disgusted and confused. They thought I was stupid, but the men didn't. I think they were impressed that I understood. Nothing cooking, I said, remembering the impeccable way in which Alice had turned away those Ray-Bans at the farmer's market. He moved his face frighteningly close to mine. His beard had the stink of meat. Yeah, he said. We're having a conversation. He bit his lower lip. You want me to get you some more beer so you can continue your conversation? No, thank you. We're leaving soon. He rested his hand on Eleanor's thigh to better balance himself as he squared his leather chest to me. I used the side of my palm to karate chop his arm off her leg, and even though he was big, he toppled. What the fuck? He rose quickly, embarrassedly, ragefully. Fucking bitch, he said. I felt protective of Eleanor, of the secret she'd been telling me, and of the baby inside of me. I grabbed her hand and we began to walk away. He was about to follow, but there were so many men out there, some with their burly women, mullets and studs and dust. Half of them were witnesses. The other half would have egged him on if he'd bent me over and tried to fuck me. We drove off through the mountains, under the trees that cast a feathered shade on the road. That was really, you're really strong, Eleanor said. I said nothing. I could feel her eyes on me as I stared at the road. Big Sky once told me I was the best female driver he'd ever known. I'd taken a dumb pride in that. I want to tell you something. I wanted to tell you from the beginning. I wanted to tell you that you shouldn't feel that bad about all that happened. What do you mean? You weren't the first person my dad cheated with. What? 
I mean, you were the last, and I guess he liked you the most. But there was also another girl from his last job. She was, like, 20. I caught them in the house. They were fucking in my parents' bed, and Robbie was in the crib. He was, like, two months old, and I was 15. And my dad asked me not to tell my mom. He cried and begged me not to tell my mom. And the fucking worst part of it was that I was attracted to the girl. It was the first time I was attracted to anyone ever. I found them when she was on her back, and my dad was, you know, eating her out. And I was attracted to her. Her body was perfect. I guess that's not the worst part. I guess the worst part is that I didn't tell my mom. Back at my house, we drank a bottle and a half of the good wine on which I'd spent an entire day's paycheck. I couldn't get out of my mind the image of Vic's head between a young girl's legs. A 20-year-old girl with a perfect body. I had never been in his house. No matter how many men I fucked in the time I knew him, and no matter how little I wanted to fuck him, and how I stopped fucking him very early into knowing him, I could not believe he'd lied to me. That he'd told me I was the first and the only. That I'd believed him. But there was Eleanor on my couch, a girl who had lived through a scourge brought upon her by her parents just as I had. Like the mother I would become, I stopped thinking of myself. I looked at her on the couch, her bare feet pulled up beneath her legs, the little feet I imagined in her mother's mouth when she was an infant. My mother told me once that she'd put my feet in her mouth when they first passed me to her. Part of her wanted to eat me, she said, and put me back in her tummy. After the wine hit, Eleanor began to cry. I'd never cried from wine. I didn't understand why people did. She cried about Robbie, about how much she missed him. I took her in my arms. It was the first time we'd touched that way. Heaving, she moved into my chest. She placed one hand across my belly. I held her tightly and rocked her like a child. She placed her cheek against my breasts, which were fuller with pregnancy. They were so plump and risen that I hadn't worn a bra in weeks. I let her cheek stay there. I let her brush her lips against my nipple, the most imperceptible of touches, but clear all the same. I knew what it was to miss the breast of a mother. Twenty nine. When I was five and misbehaving, my mother would threaten me. I had this toy stroller for a baby doll, and it didn't matter to me if there was a doll in there or not. I only needed the stroller, and I loved to wheel it around, and I wanted to go everywhere with it. The seat was soft nylon with little bunnies holding balloons, plus blocks and bows and baby rattles and pacifiers, all the sweet gumdrop stuff of babyhood. And when I was being bad, when I was refusing to put on the correct shoes, or refusing to brush my hair, or refusing to eat my Swiss chard, my mother would brandish the stroller. She would raise it high up above her head like she was going to bring it crashing down on my crown. And she would thunder, I'm going to give this thing away. I'm going to give it to Rosanna's daughter. Or she would say she was going to leave it outside on the street for one of the kids who walked down our block with their pit bull to take. The idea was that the baby stroller would go to someone less fortunate, some little girl, unlike me, who was not so lucky to have such a vaunted piece of plastic. I tried to see the evening that followed my day at the top of the world without hindsight. I tried for much of my life to isolate it as its own memory, just one night in time, another dinner. But that's proved impossible. It was the last night of my life, just as breakfast that morning was my last cereal and milk, just as the trip to Italy the year before was the last good summer I would ever know. My mother made pastina, something we had when there was not enough time for a real dinner, but also the thing that was made when I was sick or when I needed something soothing, like a pacifier. It was evident that their talk had not gone well. The quiet was colossal. Outside, the sun beat down on the sticks and the trampled grass, 
I could see the rock that I liked to sit on at the end of the gravel drive, gleaming with heat. I wanted the sun to go down. I wanted that day to be over and to fall asleep so I could wake up from the events that had transpired. But the truth is, I was so connected to my parents that what was severed between them was a larger weight on my mind than what had happened to me in the tall man's cold house. I'd been abused, of course, but you couldn't call it violent. At no point had I been grabbed against my will or shoved into a car. I bore no marks, not even the red marks on a wrist that often showed up when I was younger, and my mother yanked me off the floor of a supermarket. While my mother cooked and washed up, my father sat on a butterfly chair on the patio. He smoked a cigarette with his legs crossed languidly. When my father was on his feet, he was always moving, his hands working screwdrivers, doorknobs, polishing the grills of cars. But when he sat down, he fully sat, his flesh softening into all the ovals of his bones. My mother, on the other hand, barely sat. My memories of dinner time are of my father and me at the table and my mother rinsing plates before we were even halfway through. I suppose she did sit in restaurants. That night, it was no different. When the pastina was ready, my father and I sat down at the pine dining table. There was a side of chopped spinach with butter. My mother was not good with vegetables. They were always dark and limp. As we ate, she windexed the shelves of the refrigerator. My father looked at me with a pasted-on smile. He was always smiling at me, even in the wake of misery. Tenderly, he moved some hair off my face. I winced a little, the touch of a man suddenly meaning something other than what it always had. Beyond the screen door, the summer evening vibrated with bugs. We didn't talk at all that night, my father and I. Talking was something I did with my mother. My father listened to me and smiled and ruffled my hair. He was still and resolute in all ways, a steadfast man. Even his veins were powerful. My little princess, he said, went to the pool all by herself today. Did she swim or read? Flashes of hands and the feeling of a tongue went through my mind. It made sense that my father would have no idea what had happened to me that day, but it was unimaginable to me that my mother wouldn't. She'd often told me she was omniscient, a witch, and I believed her. As she bent forward into the mustard-yellow refrigerator, I felt she was trying to trap me with her silence. Both, I replied, watching my mother's body for a clue. Why don't you bring the dishes to the sink, help your mother clean up? I don't need any help, my mother said sharply. Her voice stopped our movements, even our breath. How can I explain her power? It was a magical thing. She was cold, but her body was warm. Even today... Even after everything, I would give both my arms to be held in hers. After a while, my father turned on the television. The sound of music was playing. To this day, I can't watch it. I can't hear the notes of any of the songs without shaking all over. That night, we saw the last hour. My father had his arm around my shoulders. Just the day before, his mother had been violently raped and only a few hours earlier his daughter had been sexually assaulted. I didn't know what he would do if he learned of the latter. But I knew he'd gone looking for the man who'd raped his mother. I felt it was possible he'd killed him. My father was one of those men with secrets. I thought that all of his secrets were the honorable kind. Revenge killing. Acts of mercy for maimed animals dying by the side of the road. I didn't understand why my mother was being so cold. I figured it was a combination of horror that my father might have killed someone and disgust over what I had done. I was terrified she would stop loving me and terrified my father might go to jail. Up until the following day, I wouldn't have had any of the long conversations with Goja that would mark the rest of my formative years. But once she had told me that simply going to sleep and seeing the next sun could fix you up that the new day would be infinitely more survivable, or at least it would seem to be. So that was what I longed for. 
I longed for the night to be over, for the new day to dawn. I swore I would never go back to the top of the world pool. I would swim exclusively in the pool with the log roll and the tired ducks and the green paddle boats and the mosquitoes. I would be a perfect child. Thirty. Vic once said to me, What do you have to fear, kid? You've lost so much. What is there left to fear? That was one of his cruelest moments. I'd been with the young boy Jack all afternoon. I'd blown off work to go to a Mets game with him. We drank piss-colored beers and cheered and shared a hot dog from opposite ends until our mouths met in the middle. After the game, Jack left me to go to Fire Island with his friends. They were off to the gay part of the island, Cherry Grove, where they liked to get drunk as older, mustachioed men hit on them. I called Vic, and he came. Out to Queens, he came, and we ate at a wonderful Thai restaurant with uneven tables and a drop-tile ceiling with water stains. That night, I cried over a bowl of papaya salad and crispy ground catfish. I was crying because of Jack, because I felt stupid. I told Vic it was only fear, the nameless fear that followed me everywhere. But Vic was stung. He had to accept Jack and accept the lie that I was trying to date people my own age or far younger, because I needed to feel normal. He brought me into his chest. I was disgusted by the expensive peak shirt that he doubtless had bought to impress me. He held me, but hated me. I could feel it. Pressing my cheek to his chest like he wanted to absorb me. What do you have to fear, kid? He asked as I sobbed. The place was BYOB, and he'd gone to the liquor store next door and bought their most expensive bottle of wine. $129.99. $129.99. He'd left the price on. He laughed, saying, Can you believe that was the most expensive bottle? The wine was spicy and not good. It barely tasted like a $20 bottle. I hated him for how little he knew about fine things. I hated him for coming all the way to Queens in a black car. For being cruel to me even though I deserved so much worse. What do you have to fear, he said. And I said, you're right. We both have nothing to fear, nothing to lose. But I have my daughter, he said. I have my daughter to lose. And I wanted to kill him because he was taunting me with fatherhood, with all that it meant. So I pushed away from his chest and said, you have to go get cash. This place is cash only, and I want to leave. Vic had been right. I'd had nothing to fear. Now that I had a child inside of me, I finally understood what he meant. On a Sunday, the blood came so rapidly and thickly that I felt like I might pass out. And then I did. My sleep was dreamless, only when I took pills. There were few times I slept without them, but this was one occasion— and all of my dreams were nightmares about my parents. Even my good dreams were nightmares, as anyone who has lost someone important knows. After passing out, I dreamed of the Atlantic City boardwalk of my youth, where my mother liked to play the slot machines, and my father and I would pass the time walking the beach, picking shells, digging for sand crabs. On rainy days, we would go to the Ocean One Mall, which was shaped like a cruise liner, and full of pastel taffy and mosquito-specked skylights. But my favorite place, probably the most magical of my childhood memory, was an indoor midway at one of the casino hotels. I tried many times to remember the name and never could. It lasted only a year or two, shutting its doors around the time I was eight or nine. It was raised to make room for something less gaudy. But right then, like Lenny, I experienced a sudden clarity and remembered the name. Tivoli Pier, in the Tropicana. The name itself was garish, like everything in Atlantic City. There was a Ferris wheel, though I don't think we ever rode it, and bumper cars, pinball machines, 
and a theater starring animated characters who looked like big-name entertainers. Dolly Parton and Wayne Newton, droopy faces that kids wouldn't know. There was a saloon and a simulated space shuttle ride that was always out of order. There were boardwalk-style rolling chairs that slid you through dark tunnels, illuminated with fiber-optic lighting. Along the walls were wax reproductions of Atlantic City's heyday. Women in high-waisted polka-dot bikinis, posing on ginger sand, high dives. The part I loved most was a flying carpet ride. It was a raised dais covered with a Persian rug, and you would sit on the rug and watch a screen in front of you that showed you flying through the night sky. You could choose from a selection of backgrounds. I'd run through them all, and my father would watch me and smile. After several hours and hundreds of tokens, we'd meet my mother and go out for a seafood buffet. All you could eat crab legs for $29.99, Coca-Cola with a glistening cherry on top. It was heaven for me. Why, I wondered, wasn't it enough for him? The rest of the night in the Poconos, the last night of my life, my mother ran a bath. None of her products were expensive. In the years to come, I would go to the houses of friends and shower in their parents' master baths and I'd be impressed by the expense or the idiosyncrasy of a particular shampoo. A lotion made of white mallow, a massage oil the color of gasoline from the woods of Wisconsin. You can tell a lot about a woman by her bath products, by the range or the minimalism. Sometimes the stingiest lady, seemingly unconcerned about her looks, will own a ferny conditioner from Paris, and you will question everything you assumed about her. My mother's products were mostly mementos from hotels. From our trips to Italy, all of them. From her honeymoon with my father, which was the first time she saw Rome and Venice and even Florence, though she grew up in a town less than a hundred miles away. She had multiple shower caps, from La Lumiere in Rome, and a beach hotel in San Benedetto. She had old yellow lotions from a hot springs hotel in Castracaro Terme and conditioner from a little albergo in Como. There was a room fragrance from a cliffside inn in Sorrento, probably the poshest of the hotels she'd ever been to, and from that same place a satchel of lavender bath salts contained in a small terry pillow. It was this satchel that she dropped into the ugly tub of our Poconos bathroom, and it was the high, bright smell of lavender that brought me away from the she cartoon I'd been watching and up that carpeted, narrow stairwell to find my mother naked and vacant in the steamy room. Her breasts were above the water, huge and white, and the rest of her, slim, tan European, was below. Many of my boxes now, the ones I have moved around and never opened, the ones that were piled on the ground floor of my Topanga home, are filled with her shower caps, with her lotions and sample sizes of perfumes. They have all gone bad, but I have still saved every single one. None of them, however, contain that bath salt satchel from Sorrento. There was only one of those, and she used it on that last night. Mommy, I said. I was wearing my rainbow bright pajamas. I don't think my mother ever saw me as a child. Please, she said. I knew what she meant. Go away, leave me be. I began to cry. It was my only recourse. The steam rose around me. How I wanted to be inside that smell, inside her arms in the water, inside her stomach again, where she couldn't push me from her. On the formica sides of the sink, which were so small that things were always slipping off, were the two Q-tips I'd used that morning. My father had taken them out of the trash. He was a doctor, and he thought nothing of spending money on lobster dinners and trips to the Amalfi Coast, but he recycled my Q-tips. He thought I used them too indulgently. My mother didn't care. I don't think she used Q-tips or, for that matter, ever had earwax or mucus in her nose. I don't remember her having a cold in all of the ten years I knew her. I heard my father light a cigarette downstairs. I heard the screen door open, and then I heard it close. 
Mommy, please, I cried. Tell me what's wrong. She shook her head and looked past me. I knelt down on the humid tiles. The shower curtain was the color of processed cheese. I fished into the hot water, found her hands, and took them in mine. I brought them to my face. Even after soaking in lavender, they still smelled cooked by cigarettes. My whole childhood is contained in that scent. The mothballs, too. I wanted to take care of her, and I wanted her to take care of me. She was the only thing in the world I wanted. Mommy, I shrieked, but my voice didn't seem to reach her. My need was so primal, so simple, and her interior was so complex. Like the mantle of the earth, with layers upon layers of nicotine staining the cracks. Thirty-one. When I woke, I was still bleeding, and there was also a remarkable pain. Eleanor was home, and she came into my bedroom and asked me if I was okay. I ignored her and walked into the bathroom. I locked the door and stayed inside for a long time. Eventually, I told Eleanor to please go out, to take my car and get as many rags as she could. Rags, she said. Why? Because I'm losing the baby. I heard her gasp. Just go. Because it had been vital for me to be practical, I decided it was all for the best. I reminded myself of the time I'd seen a picture on Big Sky's wife's Instagram during one of my morbid nights. I was doing cocaine in my apartment off of a Jimmy Buffett CD. I was scrolling through her feed, which was rarely updated and sparsely populated. But this night, there was a new image. It was of a bathroom in what was surely the Montana lake house. Their youngest son, just about a year old at the time, in a Japanese soaking tub. The walls surrounding him were made of smooth, knobby stones. It was early evening, and there was a fantastic light coming in, and you could see the sun out the window firing up the trees, those sensational ponderosa pines that Big Sky was always saying he hated chopping down. It made him feel like a murderer. So why do you do it, I asked. Because, he said, a family needs a fire. This child in the bath had no idea how lucky he was. The wife taking the picture had no idea who I was. What child could I bring into the world? You would only have had shower curtains with mold on the hems. We could only have stayed in damp motels, eating heather-colored burgers and greasy potato chips as we counted our last dollars on the filthy carpet. I'd eaten too much caviar, and I hadn't saved for your future. I'd eaten too much caviar with men who didn't marry me. It was better like this, I thought, as the blood rained out. Then a new contraction came, the worst one yet. I screamed so loud the sound might have colored the air. And then this thing, this palpable thing, released itself from under me. I caught it in my hand. It didn't look like an alien, but very definitively like a human child. The shape of it and the feeling of it the eyes nearly sewn shut. I could see the dark balls beneath beautiful, tight lids. It was blue and red with organs, and its own pumping blood, close to the surface of its glossy flesh. The nose was the most exquisite I had ever seen. It fit in my palm, and yet it was larger than the length of it. I don't remember. I only kept thinking it was large enough to live. I believed this with my whole being. You will have days when you think God is cruel, or what God is there at all. You may believe there is nothing. I believed, and then I did not. Whichever I felt on a given day, the only thing I was certain of was that I must have been wrong. That day I figured it must be a female God to give you gifts like these that cannot or should not be kept. A female god would know who could be trusted with a child, and she would also know who might need a moment's reprieve from the darkness. And then she would take the child back 
and place it into a real mother's womb and let it grow there. It had perfect hands, and I tell you this not to be sensational, but because it was perhaps the only pure feeling my heart had felt in nearly 30 years. One of its hands curled itself around my index finger, wrapped itself nearly all the way around it. My finger was so concretely, so shockingly held. I'd been held enough by my father in the short time I had him, but I had always pined after my mother's arms, her hands. I always wanted them to make a cap over my skull, to grasp me and suck me into her. But now to have my child, its little fingers, webbed still and yet delicately discreet, to have them press into me, to hold me, it was enough love to keep me for another thirty years. It recognized I was meant to care for it as long as it lived. I don't know why I keep saying it, because I knew very well, it was obvious, the child was a boy. I don't know how long he kept breathing in my hand like that. His ribs, ivory etchings beneath the gel of his skin, moved up and down in elegant puffs. With a finger from my other hand, I stroked his forehead. My baby, I said quietly. I felt peace and happiness. I knew it wouldn't last, but I allowed myself to feel it for as long as it did. When it was over, it wasn't sudden or dramatic. The breaths simply stopped. A small chill came over his body. My next emotion was rage. It was more well-defined than the happiness because I was better acquainted with rage. At what? Everything? Everyone? I wanted to kill the world. I knew that at the very least I would kill someone. It was more than a premonition. It was a promise I could control. The rage was so great it needed to go somewhere. But for once I did not have rage at myself. For once, I didn't hate myself. I loved myself as my child had. I saw myself as something greater than I thought I could be. And though certainly the feeling would fade, it still shone radiantly in that moment. Then suddenly from outside, I heard the familiar screeches. If all the misfortunes of the world could be contained in one sound, it might be the bright hell of the coyote. Then I heard them make a new sound, an angry growl that sounded more like a human imitating an animal than an animal itself. I ran with my cooling child in hand to the door. Kurt the dog was being attacked by three slavering gray beasts. That dog had nothing to prepare him for his horror, staring down the imminence of his own death. He'd been mistreated for the first year of his life, and then sent to a kill shelter, and had no idea he was set to die until he was saved by a young man with a love of the great outdoors. He'd gone from vicious kicks to steel cages to pure love and heaping bowls of food and scaling mountains and sleeping in a bed with a warm body. I saw River come running from his yurt. Then I looked down and watched as one of the coyote's teeth, glistening and white, caught on Kurt's fur. I saw the dog pull back and a strip of his furred skin come away from him. I screamed and one of them came toward me. Everything was going so fast, I didn't think with my human brain, and so I suppose that's why I did the only thing that made sense. My hands released my glowing fetus. Everything stopped. The night went clear, a wash of starlight. I felt my knees buckle, and the dog ran into my house. Where's Kurt? River screamed. I pointed inside. River, ignorant to what had happened, ran in and came out holding the enormous bloodied dog in his arms. Thank you, he said to me, weeping. I didn't do anything, I said. Then I went inside and collapsed on the disgusting couch. When I woke, Lenny was stroking my hand. I noticed he'd somehow turned the air conditioner off, perhaps with his cane like a geriatric crusader, 
hitting the switch on his first jab. Joan, he said, thank goodness. I wasn't sure if you fainted or what. My God, those vicious creatures. You're bloodied, dear. Did they get you? Did they nip you somewhere? They don't generally go after humans. I didn't say anything. I was very still. I thought about what those people with their normal lives would think about me now. I knew I would never be able to tell anyone, not even Alice. Nobody wants to hear about great suffering or anarchic decisions. They think it's an offense against their ears, their lives. I cleaned up your vomit from earlier. I understand you were embarrassed. Of course, I was too. I told you a great deal of things about my life that... I won't say I regret it, but I don't feel like you understood. I don't think you understand men on the one hand and love on the other. I nodded, feeling my hands lit with blood. Proust said that hell was the suffering that comes from the inability to love. I weep for your suffering, Joan. I know you have your reasons. I hoped you would tell them to me as I told you mine. But perhaps your condition is worse even than I suspected. I looked at him, pressed my palm to my empty belly, and cackled like a witch. He was wearing the watch. He was sure of his mental state in that moment, and that was why he was wearing it. He believed that the drugs were going to save him. Joan, are you all right? Leonard, I am more than all right. I am absolutely wonderful. Where is my red dress? Where is my red dress? I looked around crazily. Joan, please, you're... I'm depraved, I said. Isn't it fun? Outside it was quiet. The coyotes had gone about their evening. Soon Eleanor would be back with the rags and I would use them for the blood. I didn't have a washing machine, so I would have to bag them and drive them to the dump. I didn't remember a washing machine in the Poconos. It was possible we didn't have one in that crappy mountain home. I've just never seen you like this, Leonard said. I turned away and walked toward the window. I could see very clearly where the child had fallen. I would have to move out of this horrible house immediately. I could never comprehend how someone could continue to live in a place where a loved one had died. Joan. Shh, darling. I have a craving for a chopped egg sandwich. With mayonnaise and some nice cracked pepper, let me make us a platter. You can't take the pill on an empty stomach. He nodded agreeably and I moved to the kitchen. My voice just then had come from deep in my lungs, not from the back of my mouth, as a different older man once remarked of me. Speak from here, he told me, jabbing me just below my breasts. You sound unattractive when you speak from the back of your mouth. It's low class. It was strange to no longer be in pain after all those hours of it. I boiled the water for the eggs with a drop of vinegar, as my mother had done. Not as she'd taught me, but as I'd watched her do. I boiled the water and felt the blood drying in my underwear. Lenny once said he could understand how a woman like me could turn a man crazy. Not even my looks, he said, which were formidable. Formidable. But my presence. I was very real, he said. It didn't take me long to drop Lenny down the rabbit hole. By that point, I knew a good amount about Lenore. I knew her favorite colors and music and foods, and precisely the shitty way she prepared an egg. Absently, I drew my hair into a sloppy chignon. I'd seen several pictures of Lenore, in the ocean and in the pool and at formal events, and I'd noted the way she crossed her arms and smiled when she was shy. I imbued my knowledge of her and his love for her and his betrayal of her into my role. Had I been going after a part, had playing Lenore been an audition, I'd have nailed it. I'd learned that I could keep him in the hole the longest when I never let the Lenore spell be broken. Mostly that meant being fawning, 
treating him like he was the most learned man in the world, the most gallant and benevolent and brilliant. It was exhausting. The eggs were just barely cooked when he called out to me. Lenore, he said, Just a moment, darling. I have to get these eggs off the heat so the yolks don't overcook. I know how you hate a powdery yolk. Yes, but I also don't like it too wet. Of course. I ran the eggs under cool water and began to peel them while they were still hot. My mother could touch the bottom of a boiling pan. She could hold anything without mitts. Indeed, her hands were calloused, but I always suspected there was something else at work. Witchery. I mashed the eggs between the tines of a fork. I added a tablespoon of mayonnaise and a teaspoon of horseradish sauce. I added smoked sea salt and freshly cracked black peppercorns. As I approached Lenny, he finally looked below my waist. Lenore, my dear, did you spill something on yourself? Not exactly. What is that, he asked, pointing to my thighs. Lenore, is that blood? I lost our baby. Oh, dear. But it's all right, I said, sitting beside him and taking his hands in mine. We'll try again. He nodded and looked all around the room. He wrung his hands as old men do. Was it painful, my love? Not too bad, I said. Sometimes it's for the best, you know. You're right, darling. You're right about everything. Oh, Lenore, that's kind of you. I've studied and read my whole life, my love. I come from a long line of wise men. Please, dear, try some of this egg salad. My Lenore, he said, not a woman of the kitchen. Well, you didn't marry me for my cooking. He nodded. He licked his lips. He brought his wrinkled hand around to rest on my rear, cool and wet with blood. Darling, you're aroused, he said. Oh, always when you touch me, you know that. But now is not the time. We wouldn't want to make a mess. Wouldn't we, he said, smiling impishly. I suppose I could lay down some sheets. Go lay down some sheets. I'll eat my lunch and be right behind you. My legs felt rubbery as I walked up the spiral staircase to the hottest bedroom in the world. I'd taken two Klonopin right before my child was born, and the effect was finally at work. I heard the wretched sounds of him eating, the dentures clacking, the whole mouth working to move the soft food down the throat. That noise was enough of a reason to kill him. My white dress was bright red from the waist down. It was rather lovely. I figured I could dye the whole thing red. I took it off and used it to wipe between my legs. I put on a clean pair of underwear and a green t-shirt that said Montana on it. I would love to tell you it belonged to Big Sky, but it didn't. There was a night he came to my apartment wearing the same t-shirt. After we fucked, as he was putting the t-shirt back on, I was struck with the usual fear. He was about to leave. I never knew when I'd see him again. Every time could be the last time. He was going home to her. She got to have this man in this t-shirt. I was naked in the bed. Listen, you must always be the first one to dress. This is obligatory. I didn't know to do that. Goja hadn't lived long enough to impart that wisdom. We lie there naked after the other person rises because we can't bear to leave the space. We can't leave the sweat and the warmth because we love it too much. We love it more, nearly, than we love the asshole rising to put on his t-shirt. Don't be the fucked one. Be the first to rise. Meekly, I asked, Can I hold on to that shirt? He laughed. I mean it. Can I have it? He continued to laugh and shake his head. Please, I said, hating myself. He left quicker than usual. 
He usually stayed long enough to come twice. The moment he was out the door, I opened my computer and bought the same shirt off the internet. Ponderosa pines on a green background. Lenore, are you ready? Lenny called from the bottom of the stairs. I looked down and saw the dirty plate on the table, the fork beside it. There were little mounds of egg salad on the table that he must have dropped as he spooned a second serving onto his plate. My father used to bring all the dishes to the sink. He even asked me to place my dirty clothes neatly in the laundry. If I left something inside out, he considered it disrespectful to my mother. Leonard wasn't the type to pick up his plates. He'd grown up with a live-in housekeeper in some colonial house with a foyer table and fresh flowers every three days. Put that fucking dish in the sink, my love. I could have said anything to him as long as I did it in his sweet Lenore's voice. He stuttered something and dutifully bust his dishes. Then I heard him make his way up the stairs. Remember when we met? Of course, I said, you were my boss. I didn't like you at first. You were married and ugly. Excuse me? You were ugly, Leonard. You are ugly, but it's okay. I was never ugly. That's true. You were never ugly. He approached the bed and unbuttoned his fine linen shirt. His hands were shaking with his disease. The full extent of his disability was revealing itself to me. The heat was too much for me to bear, and I couldn't imagine how he was handling it. He lay down beside me, shirtless. He wore nice khaki pants and simple black socks. Kalanapin is a wonderful thing. Xanax, Ambien, they melt you down to your wolf tone. I remember the first night I read to you from Muldoon in Cantata. Do you remember? Every stanza is a sentence, I told you. And you, silly thing, you hardly knew what a stanza meant. You wore a lime green dress. It suited you, but of course a paper bag would have suited you. He scuttled closer. His touch was odious, and yet Vic's had been worse. I could count on one hand the number of times we'd fucked traditionally the number of times I hadn't simply masturbated in front of him. I couldn't for the life of me call up the sound of Vic coming. Honestly, I felt like his love for me, what he thought was love, drowned out his lust. Len, I said. He brought his hand to rest over my belly. Yes, my life? I'm a whore, my love, a filthy used-up whore. So fuck me. You can feel how wet I am. Only whores are wet like this. He gasped and began to pinch at me with his old fingers, roughly and cruelly. How I missed my child. In the mere moments he lived, my child showed me how useless men could be. How boring, how selfish. This old man, this old killer. I groaned against the invasion of his hand on the place where my child had fallen, but he thought it was rapture. My rage was growing by the second. I felt the tendons in my neck straining like a junkyard dog's against a chain. I closed my eyes. I pulsed my pelvis against his bony hand when I heard the music from that night. Thirty-two. My mother didn't know how to use the paltry sound system in the Pocono house. She barely knew how to drive. The only thing she understood was the Vanity Fair Circus Animals record player that belonged to me, with its fat orange needle in its own little suitcase. And that was the sound I woke up to that night. The lion sleeps tonight by the tokens, turned up as loud as the player could go. I was waking up all the time back then, usually between three and four in the morning. I'd look at the clock at my bedside and panic, knowing the earliest I could crawl into bed beside my mother was six. I would have two or more hours of waiting, 
eyes on the ceiling haunted by shadows against the window. But this time I heard the player, which was kept in the spare room between my parents' bedroom and mine. I worried it was my mistake somehow, that I'd left it on, and that one or both of them would yell at me for ruining their sleep. My mother, especially, acted like her sleep was something that could be lost, never to be found again. I rose and walked to the spare bedroom. The door was open and the record was spinning on its axis. Now I felt with a profound and queasy certainty that my mother knew where I'd gone that day, that she'd seen me in my damp bikini in the cold house of the man who licked me all over. In any case, I felt sure that she was playing my music to lure me out, to wrest the truth from me. She was capable of such a ruse. I thought she could do anything. She was a witch. She was the most beautiful woman in the world. Her breasts were the color of milk and cold. The rest of her was warm, but her breasts felt refrigerated. I used to love to touch her nipples. Several years after I'd stopped suckling from them, I used to reach my small hands down her low-cut blouses under the tight, cheap skin of her bra and try to hold her nipple between my fingers. I turned the player off. All that remained was the whirring of the fan in my parents' bedroom. The door was closed, which was unusual. I figured they could be having sex. I wondered if part of sex was licking someone all over, as the man, Wilt, had done to me. It bothered me to think of what they might be doing behind the door. I also thought it was possible they were discussing where I'd been in the afternoon. I wouldn't have expected police to be involved, but I did think they were discussing whether or not to send me away to boarding school. My mother often threatened this when I was being bad. She told me they would ship me off with a small suitcase to a place up in the mountains, Castle Roto, where you had to drink goat's milk every morning and suck down raw egg yolks. Once she went so far as to drive me to the train station with my little she luggage packed haphazardly, with shirts and socks and my favorite doll, Marco. I was seven or eight then and didn't know you couldn't get to Italy by train. I shivered and sobbed and began to hyperventilate as my mother strode up to the ticket seller. She took out her huge burgundy wallet and I thought I was going to die. I began to scream. Even though my father was at work and would have had no idea of this cruelty, I screamed, Daddy, so loud that nearly everyone in the vast hall turned to look. One of my mother's fears, the disapproval of Americans. She came away from the counter, brought my chin up close with her sharp nails and hissed, You ear me? If you ever touch my jewelry again without asking, I will come straight ear with you. I won't tell your father and you will think you ran away. You ear me? I don't think I did anything wrong for the next three years. Nothing of note until that day when I got into the man's car. And now I was expecting the biggest punishment of all. I couldn't wait any longer. I wrapped the door lightly. Nothing. I knocked again, this time louder. Still nothing so I turned the knob ever so gently and pushed open the door. I can't describe what I saw without going through it all over. I don't mind as much now. It used to be that even thinking about opening the door, cheap cedar-stained mahogany would send me retching into the nearest toilet. It was him, my beloved father, on the bed. The sheets were a tweedy brown, so the blood was merely a dark stain. My mother's reading light was on and illuminated the room just enough. Later, I would learn that there were slashes in other places, but I only saw the knife in his throat. I knew exactly which knife it was. She used it on bread and meat. In wealthy houses in the future, I would learned there were knives for bread and knives for meat and knives for fruit, all different kinds of knives, my mother would have considered that spoiled. She used one knife for everything, her good knife. She had one good knife in each house, one in New Jersey and one in the Poconos. It had a wooden handle, and its blade was smooth and thick. My father's beautiful blue eyes were open, staring. 
Daddy, 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 Daddy. I used to call his name every night. There was a tradition, a routine. I waited near the window in the formal living room we never used, with the antique furniture and the fireplace maned in stucco. I watched through the drapes for his headlights. If they were nine minutes past six, I thought for sure my life would be over. At the same time, I couldn't conceive of the worst thing in the world, to lose my father. I'd make my way to the garage and begin clapping and calling his name high-pitched. One clap for Da, one for D. Then he would get out of the car with his briefcase and the smell of hospitals, and his eyes would flash at me, and he would smile the happiest, kindest smile. He would take me into his arms, no matter what he was already carrying. What I saw then was impossible, but that's what happened that night. I learned that the impossible was possible. In a way, there can be nothing more liberating. I ran to the bed and tried to lift his body. Of course, he was too heavy. The knife was in very deep. Do you believe that I pulled it out? I would have done anything for him. I'll never forget that feeling. I believe he came alive for a second when the knife came out. His blood was all over my rainbow bright pajamas. I thought my mother would be angry about the mess on me, and that was the first time I thought of her, so I screamed for her. Mommy, mommy, mommy. The bathroom door was open, and I didn't want to leave my father, but I did. I ran with the knife in my hand to the bathroom, and there was my mother, in the bathtub, with her wrists slit, but she wasn't dead. She was only almost dead. Her eyes blinked, her mouth moved, and I don't know. I think about this every day, never less than once a day, though sometimes up to a hundred times a day. I think, if I had called for help right away, she might have been saved. But I didn't call right away. It wasn't on purpose. I just didn't think of it yet. My mother was still alive, and she was my authority. She was my God. Her nipples and her hair floated above the line of the rosy water. She didn't like to get her hair wet. She only washed it every three days or so. She never went into a pool above her shoulders. The ocean, the lake, forget it. I knelt beside her face, which was blooming with death, barely seeing, but there was something tender in her eyes. Holy Jesus, it made me weep in some sort of gratitude. The weeping was coming from so many places that I can't tell how much of it was gratitude, but yes, I think some of it was. I shrank down below the lip of the tub and took one of her soggy, queenly hands and placed it on the top of my head. And then I rose my head up into the basket of her hand so that it felt like she was grasping me, loving me back. In fact, I'm sure that she was. And I wept and said, Oh, Mommy. Oh, Mommy. Oh, Mommy. Oh, Mommy. Until eventually, she was gone. It wasn't until an hour after I found them that I dialed 911 from the cream phone on my mother's nightstand. I waited so long, I think, because I could still sense their life forces in the air. As long as I could feel them, I didn't want to call up the external world. My parents and I had been a unit, a capsule. Inviting the outside in was forbidden. That was for families who didn't know where their children were after 10 p.m. It wasn't until after their deaths that I saw how foolish I was. I had thought I was the one most likely to breach the security of our capsule, when in fact the walls were permeable. For years, my parents had been waltzing in and out recklessly. The officers who came thought I did it, for a moment at least. I was carrying the knife when they showed up. It made me feel closer to my father. They asked me who my next of kin was, who they should call. The sun was rising. Daylight made it real. I didn't have Goja's number memorized. I didn't know any numbers except my house and my father's office. The only number I had written down was Wilts inside Tropic of Cancer so I went and got it because I was ashamed not to have anybody else. I read it aloud to the officer, 
who was not dealing with the bodies. It was 6 a.m. by that time, and I could hear a man's sleepy voice on the other end of the line, and the officer introduced himself as Bushkill Police, and the man said they had the wrong number. I told them I thought it was my uncle, but I guessed it was the wrong number. Eventually, they got a hold of Goja. She arrived, perfumed and puffy, by 10 a.m. That was when it hit me, how alone I was. Goja, of course, would become my savior, but that morning there was just a black Mercedes, glinting and foreign in our gravel drive. A tall half-stranger emerged, wearing diamonds, face still rouged from the night before. She smelled like sour flowers. My brown wool life was all gone. She told me everything right away. She took me out of the house and to the Caesars Pocono Resort. Now it's renamed something seamier, Palace Stream or Lover's Delight, but it was always one of those honeymoon fuck forts with the champagne glass bathtubs and the fruit salad breakfasts. I've always wondered who is turned on by that, who wants to fuck in heart-shaped tubs. Men with blonde beards, women who love baby's breath in their bouquet of red roses. Goja took me there because it was the first place she saw on the road that was open. My lips were blue and she worried I was dying of shock. The frizzy-haired woman at the front desk said, it's couples only. Goja pulled what I imagined was an impressive credit card from her wallet and slapped it on the counter. We walked into a purple dining room with gold tables and casino carpets. She ordered herself a tea and me a coffee. She didn't try to make me eat. She began to tell me everything. It seemed she knew more than anyone in the world. The night before, when my father had left to see his raped mother, there had been someone else to see. The woman he'd been fucking. The woman had called his doctor's answering service all weekend long. She had him paged several times up in the mountains. He'd been lamentably ignoring her for days, and then his mother was raped. He drove to New Jersey, examined his mother, bandaged, and consoled her. Goja was there with my uncle. She saw the whole thing. My father said he'd be back. Everyone thought he was going to go after the rapist, just be a crazy man in the streets. But he went to his lover's apartment, an Italian woman living above the restaurant for which she cooked. She was more than the woman he'd been fucking. Goja told me he loved her. I remember she said this, and I felt she was saying it to try to hurt me, to put me in my place. As a second wife herself, she wanted the first wives and first daughters to know they were replaceable. It wasn't until much later that I realized she had a more noble motive. This other woman was a beauty, even more beautiful than your mother. Black hair, blue eyes, blood-red lips, metronome breasts, and much younger. He drove to her apartment in the middle of the night. This young beauty had something to tell him. She was pregnant. She said her child would not be a bastard living above an oven. She commanded him to tell my mother, to tell her that he loved her, that this was going to be his child too. She had some kind of hold over him, Goja said to me in that purple room. I think how it has affected me that the two most important women of my life were heavily accented. Their voices like church bells resounding in my head. Your father loved women. He loved them too much. My father came home that next morning, having not slept at all. I wondered, even that day, I wondered if he had sex with his pregnant lover. With her oils on him, he returned to our mountain home and drove me to the top of the world pool, where I met Wilt and got assaulted. That this was not the darkest part of my childhood, can you imagine? While I was at the pool, my father told my mother about the lover, and of course, she'd already suspected he was fucking someone. Now he told her that not only were her worst fears realized, but that there was something else she hadn't even thought to fear. His lover was pregnant, and he would not turn his back on this child. Goja told me he was penitent, 
as much as a man who'd made a grievous mistake could be. But your mother was dragon, Goja said. Dragons cannot stand by. She told me that when my father went to pick me up from the pool, my mother called her. She told Goja everything. Goja advised her to leave, to pack me up and return to Italy. Every day I thought about that. What if my mother and I had been the ones to go back to Italy? What if my mother had chosen me the way Alice's mother chose her? I can count on you, she said to Goja. If anything happens, she will be yours. Goja said, yes, of course, will be my baby. And here Goja cried to me. She took my hands across the gold table and crushed them. I didn't believe she was going to do it. Some part of me, yes. I almost drove to here. And then I did not. My father did not become the bad guy for me. Not yet. That day I hated my mother for killing my father, but also for all the reasons you cannot say. Part of my child brain hated her because she wasn't young enough, or even beautiful enough, because she wasn't strong enough or because she was too strong, because she was so complex where my father was not. I hated my mother, in short, for being a woman. Thirty-three. In the bed beside me, Leonard's penis had grown rigid alongside my thigh. He was pressing it against me. Mmm, he said over and over, Mm. I was still hearing the lion sleeps tonight in my ears. I thought of my father making a child with someone, the selfishness especially, to come inside another woman. All my life, all the men taking what they wanted and leaving when it was over. Big Sky, the slug in Marfa, my first bad man from the top of the world, the man who raped my grandmother what my father did to my mother, what Leonard did to Lenore, what Vic did to his wife and their son and his daughter, what my father did to me. All the men from all the clubs and airplanes and dockside restaurants. All the fingers inside the waistbands of our underwear. I heard the door open downstairs. Go away, I hissed. Please, Eleanor called. She sounded like me, trying to get into my mother's bed. Please go away. I need to be alone. The door closed. Who was that? Leonard whispered, as though we were teenagers covertly fucking. A woman, a friend, nobody. You're so wet, Leonard said as he tried to push himself into me. Those words coming out of an old man's mouth. Were women blameless? I didn't care in that moment. I thought of my son, his thin, wet bones, the incorruptible gift of him. I felt close to my mother then, to feel her rage in me. I turned to face the old man, swinging one of my legs over his to pin him. I wrapped my hands around his chicken-skin throat. I looked at the magnificent watch around his gaunt wrist. I would come to find out it was worth an inconceivable amount of money. More than Lenny had alluded to, perhaps even more than he was aware. I could feel Eleanor's presence outside the door. I would have invited anyone inside to watch. I knew what I was doing was fine, and I knew I could legitimize it, even to God. As Lenny was dying, he held my face in his hands. I thought he was attempting to strangle me back. He was about to speak, and I spat in his eye to make him stop. I would not let him have any more last words. I would never again be the basin in which a wretched man would bob about. Smiling, I closed my eyes and transferred the force of my whole body and history into my hands. Killing a man felt more glorious than I could ever have imagined. 34. 
In the days that followed, I began to pack up what little I'd unpacked. I told Eleanor I was going to move out and that I didn't know where I would go. She was terrified. I knew the feeling. She sat and watched me as I moved around the place, dropping loose eyeliners into big boxes. I unblocked her mother's phone number and multiple texts came through just like that. It was plain that the woman had never stopped, not at all. Sometimes there were two or so an hour. Half of them asked after her daughter. Please tell me, please, is she with you? I showed those to Eleanor. I asked her to please let me tell her mother that she was all right. The other half, I would never show her. How many times did you fuck my husband? Did he eat your cunt? Did he give you orgasms? I have never had an orgasm in my life. That's why he went to you. Men need to know they please. Tell me how he came. Did he come inside you? Tell me. I believe she thought that her daughter killed me, so that her messages were going into the ether. It must have assuaged her pain. That was the least we could do, Eleanor and I. Not responding was the least we could do. The next day, one came that made me forcibly send Eleanor home in that moment. I was throwing out all my cheap dishware. I passed the full-length mirror and caught sight of myself. I was wearing my mother's slip dress for what would be the last time. I dyed it red with writ liquid dye in the shower. The shower would be stained forever. Now the color was uniform from top to bottom. I looked like a young girl in the mirror. Perhaps it was a trick of the light. My eyes shone with the absurdity of it all. I felt peace, you see, because I'd embraced the madness. And yet I don't believe it was madness. I use the word as shorthand. The world will call it madness. You can't convince normal people otherwise. There's a simple small line at the mouth of hell. It's not a big deal when you get there. It's just another step is all. If you ever cross it, as I did, you will see that black things become the most honest ones of all. You must remember that most people don't like to hear when bad things happen. They can tolerate only a little here and there. The bad things must be comestible. If there are too many bad things, they plug their ears and vilify the victim. But a hundred very bad things happened to me. Am I supposed to be quiet? Bear my pain like a good girl? Or shall I be very bad and take it out on the world? Either way, I won't be loved. That was when my phone dinged. My heart jumped. I thought it might be Alice, but it was Mary. Because of you, I held my dead boy in my hands. He was blue, he turned blue in my arms. Do you know what it's like to hold your dead baby in your arms? Upon reading it, I threw the phone against the wall. It hit the frog vase with my father inside. The vase cracked into several pieces, and all of my father's ashes were lost to the floor, to the grains and crevices of the uncleanable wood. At first, I tried to scoop them up, but my hand came back with dust and strands of hair and an uncooked lentil. So I vacuumed the whole area. It was less painful than I would have expected. My mother's ashes remained intact on the mantel. Eleanor walked in from the deck where she'd taken to sunning herself in the early afternoons. I heard a noise. Are you okay? Since the miscarriage, she'd been attending to me so kindly. She never asked me about Lenny, about the way it happened. Just like her father, she was careful not to ire. She was a quiet, wonderful listener. In an eerie way, the girl and I loved each other but that didn't take away from the prison of it all. Now that Lenny was gone, she'd floated the notion that she wouldn't have to leave until his cousin up in San Francisco sold the place. I worried about the cousin coming for the watch, but I never heard a thing. In fact, the only person who said anything who made me feel culpable was Kevin. Several days after Lenny's death, Kevin approached me as I was getting out of my car. We said hello. It was the first time we'd seen each other in a while. I wanted to offer my condolences, he said. 
What do you mean? Lenny, I mean. Death in your house, Miss Joan. He placed one of his elegant hands on my shoulder and looked at me. I willed my body not to tremble. He knew. I knew that he did. Don't beat yourself up about it. About what? You know, he said, you couldn't have saved him. Later, I would sit with that line. I would wonder which man Kevin was talking about. I could swear I'd seen something in his eyes, a flicker of my history. Sorry to know you're going. I wish we could have gotten to know each other. We kept very different schedules, I said. He smiled and regarded me. Since coming to California, I'd known two men, River and Kevin, both of whom looked at me in ways that didn't repel me, that did, in fact, the opposite. They made me feel girlish and small and protected. You're pretty, Kevin said. He said it very plainly, like it was an obvious thing, but something which needed to be recorded in the atmosphere all the same. I struggled to remember if I had ever been called pretty. I smiled and thanked him as though it were no big deal, and yet it broke my heart in the holiest of ways. That man did more for me in one line than any man had ever done. The word pretty. That fucking word. He nodded and backed away from me slowly, his eyes on me in a hallowed way, until he opened his underground door and disappeared. Three months later, a private jet would go down over Musha Key, and I didn't have to read the story to know that he had been on the flight. I felt that it was my fault, because he had shown a light on me. Back in the house, Eleanor was waiting. Likely, she'd been looking out the window. I was more frightened of Eleanor than I was of anyone coming after me for murder or, worse, theft. I worried that if I didn't make a change, she and I would become partners of a sort, which was one of the reasons, besides the death of my child, that I was moving. You have to go home to your mother today, I said. No, Joan, please. Forgive her. She began to convulse, saying please over and over again. I didn't know what to do, and so I took the red slip off my body. I stood essentially naked before the girl and took her into my arms, pressing her into my body as she wept. Then I pushed her back and handed my beloved dress to her. She was shocked. The only way I knew how to get people to leave was to give them things that meant something to me. I could afford to give up anything tangible, but I was scared to death to give my time or my heart. She drove her body back into my arms, and I stroked her hair and whispered in her ear, Eleanor, do you hear me? I'd give the world to have my mother back. And she was a real cunt. Thirty-five. I found a rental in the Palisades with a terrific view of the ocean. It was white and modern and almost entirely windowed. It was on stilts, hovering high above the houses beneath it. It wasn't my taste, but its clean lines and featureless rooms were blank, and I craved blankness. It was preposterously expensive, but once again, I had no one for whom to care. For several weeks, I barely left the place. I walked through the high-ceilinged rooms and opened one box every few days. I would unpack only half the box, get tired, and take a pill. I was terrifically lonely, but it was a familiar emotion. I missed Alice so much that I ached when I woke in the morning, imagining her doing sun salutations in her foul yard. One rainy afternoon, God, how I hated that it never rained in Los Angeles. I rented a pickup and drove up to the canyon to pick up the plume. I'd expected to leave it there for Kevin or River or the new tenant of the hot house, but I had no furniture. And though I could afford to buy some, I felt the piece would work in my new glassy living room. It was garish, and I missed it. River was playing catch with Kurt when I drove up. 
He shielded his eyes from the sun and smiled. Joan, he said. His smile was so pretty and his demeanor so light that even just being near him made me feel a modicum of peace. He helped me load the couch into my truck. It was hotter than ever in the house. Without furniture, it looked satanic. It felt like everything that had happened in the house was not real. To see it empty like that, I could talk myself into the idea that I hadn't lost a child and killed a man in the house. River made a big show of carrying the massive plume on his back like Atlas. In the past, I might have effusively complimented his strength, but this time I only looked down at my phone, disengaged. When he came back in, I thanked him, and he stood there unsurely. I turned and walked to the kitchen window where I'd spent so much time looking to see if the coyotes were prowling. Quietly and tentatively, River came up from behind and kissed me on the neck the way Vic had done in Scotland. But when River did it, it felt cleansing. I didn't turn around, and he gently raised my arms and pressed my palms to the wall over my head. He threaded his fingers through mine. We made love. It was a tender and peaceful closure. When it was over, he held my body, both of us still standing. He had such strong arms. It was a good way to leave the house. He wanted to come with me to see my place. I told him maybe next time. He looked a little wounded, and I realized that true power came from not caring about anyone. That was the last time I would sleep with a man. I was through with the gender. All I wanted was to see Alice, to tell her the way my child had ended, the way our father met his end. I wanted to tell her why I'd walked through the world in corpse pose. I wanted to know if my mother's intuition was correct, if my father was going to leave us for the woman over the oven and her unborn child. I'd missed her as much as I hated her. I imagined what she would have said if I'd taken her upstairs and showed her the corpse of the old man. I dreamed of her brushing her hand along his cool chest and saying, Honestly, it's all right. It was your only recourse. Deplorably, immaturely, I would have felt proud to tell her the way it ended. The way the police came and the ambulance too, pointlessly. After strangling Lenny, I pushed his body down the spiral staircase. He didn't go all the way down but landed in the middle, arms hanging between the slats and legs dangling, like a tangled marionette. That was where I left him. I told the police that I'd been sleeping off a miscarriage upstairs and he must have come in, as he'd done a time or two in the past during one of his episodes, and I woke to feel his erection against my rear, and I screamed and he jumped. He turned to run but tripped because he was old and out of it, and this is where he landed, I said, indifferently pointing to the spot. The air in the house was thick with the smell of old blood. The men just wanted to get out of there. They didn't question a thing. I couldn't stop thinking how I'd been so needy with Alice. I was disgusted that I had always been the one talking. I was disgusted that I'd felt complete with her and that she didn't need me. Thirty-six. Months passed, and I grew less and less human, but in a wondrous way. At least it was wondrous to me. My stomach was still sloped. I wasn't eating much, and yet I had a considerable gut. It seemed I was holding on to the fat, as I'd heard sometimes happened after a miscarriage. Then again, I had become appallingly sedentary. Days went by that I didn't comb my hair. I would never have to work again, or at least not for many years. It turned out Leonard's watch was worth not only more than his whole life, but more than those of his ancestors as well. I took the watch to an appraiser in the valley, he was so shocked when I laid it on his velvet tray that I thought he might pass out. I could have taken it elsewhere for a second opinion, but I didn't. He might have ripped me off, but at that price point, it really didn't matter. I thought about moving back to New York to Charles Street. 
I could now, impossibly, afford the type of apartment that Big Sky's friend owned, the one I coveted with the sauna wood and the thick white towels in the linen closet. But I grew to love my place near the ocean. Love is not the right word. Most days I walked along the water or sat at its edge with my eyes closed, watching films inside my brain. I never wore shoes. I was a cat lady on the sand. Dogs ran past me. Eleanor and I texted several times a week. I could manage any relationship over text message. She was back home with her mother, who was on many antipsychotic drugs. Eleanor told me that Mary watched cartoons all day, reruns of Three's Company. I wish I didn't love her, she wrote one day. You can't unlove someone, I wrote. You can only hate them. She's too broken to hate. I'm sorry, I wrote. I was thinking maybe of coming out there to say hi. Maybe we could go to Cold Spring. She would write something like that and I would avoid her for days. She always understood. She pulled back, but it was only a matter of time before she would pitch forward again. I lived in fear of a knock on my new door. I hadn't given anyone my new address. I paid for a post office box in town. Then one day, Eleanor told me she had met someone. A girl with a good family. For girls like us, a good family was something to die for. At length, she sent me a picture of herself and a woman in her late thirties outside the Freedom Tower the two of them holding hands and looking at each other. I was so happy for her that I cried. Naturally and daily, I thought of killing myself. Not with pills, as I'd always planned, but to drown in the ocean. I felt I was owed that final beauty. But the instinct for survival is tremendous, which is why I felt my mother was stronger than I ever could have imagined. One typically cloudless day, I was in the Dunkin' Donuts on La Cienega, and there was a woman at the counter, a very tall black woman with beautiful sneakers and calves that sprang. I want it sweet, 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 she said. I thought her voice was magic. She didn't once look at the man she was ordering from. You hear me? And black, black like me. Seated at two separate tables were a Mexican woman and an old white man with paint-stained carpenter pants and a t-shirt spotted with sweat. Hello, Billy, the Mexican woman said. Hey, Rosita, said the old white man. He never looked at her. You married yet? No, I don't want to. Billy nodded like he knew she was lying. She had huge breasts with a cavern in between, an old dress with embroidered flowers. How about you, Rosita said. You married yet? Me? Nah. So, Rosita said, see? Why are you asking me if I'm married if you ain't? Billy acted like Rosita hadn't said anything. At the counter, the black lady tested her coffee. Ain't sweet enough, she bellowed. I said, sweet. It was that very moment that something hurtled into my body and tried to saw me apart from the inside. I thought I might finally die. But the pain subsided, and I could once again hear Rosita and Billy talking about how the one good thing about Los Angeles was that your mailboxes didn't get crushed by the snow plow and I clocked myself being surprised that either of them had ever lived somewhere other than this Dunkin' Donuts. And because I needed to be punished for that thought, the pain came again. Something was cracking inside of my rear. Something was whipping me. My body was attacking itself. It got worse quickly, until I could no longer stand up. I called her. I hadn't spoken to her since the Santa Monica Pier but she was all I had left. She had always been the only thing I had left. I'd felt her beside me in bed when she was old enough to be a straight body. I'd felt her little lips against my neck, 
her little legs kicking against mine. I watched her Prius pull into the parking lot of the worst Dunkin' Donuts in Los Angeles. I was hunched over a table. Nobody in there cared if I was dying. She emerged from her car in a black bodysuit and saw me through the dirty window. It wasn't her fault that my father had come inside another woman. The next contraction was the worst one yet. The pain started in my rear. If the sound of someone hitting a cymbal could be translated into a physical sensation, that's what it felt like. It shot up through my stomach and out through my head. I buckled. And then Alice was inside, holding me, and I was screaming. Too much caffeine, Alice called out to the rubbernecking patrons. She drove very fast while I stared out the window and occasionally convulsed in pain. I was trying not to look at her. I was trying to be perfect. I was about to have a child, and yet I was mostly thinking of not scaring Alice away. She brought one hand to my leg and left it there, and I was filled with tremendous gratitude. At the base of the canyon, I asked her if she knew we were sisters. She told me that, at her mother's funeral, one of her mother's casual ex-lovers had insinuated something. Alice had asked around, but nobody really knew for sure. Her mother was very private. Have you always known, she asked me. For a long time, yes. When Goja died, I didn't hear about it for over a week. Even in her death, she was uncomplicated. She'd been skiing in Courchevel with someone who wasn't my uncle. She had a stroke coming down a black. She was rushed to the hospital but gave out in the ambulance. She was 63 and well-kept. Her platinum hair lush, her neck smooth and mostly unwrinkled. There was no funeral because she hadn't wanted one. And there was no one stronger than her left standing, so nobody went against her wishes. In the end, she knew nobody wanted to make a fuss about anything. When someone was gone, there was nothing left to do. The carrying on was exhausting. The attending to tradition when you could be drinking wine and grieving in the sun. In addition to several trust documents and her own jewelry collection, Goja had left me one other item. A slip of paper in a sealed envelope. It was an airmail envelope but I don't think that meant anything. The slip of paper was crude, cut off of something larger. It was unlike Goja, because all of her gifts, all of her gestures were grand. She didn't skimp or try to save money. The information on the slip was meant for a rainy day of sorts, and I think it was the only thing in my life that I went after at just the right time. On the outside of the envelope, she'd written, Wait until you need and inside the fold, it had Alice's full name. It didn't say sister, but of course I knew. As for Alice, she knew she was conceived illegitimately. She knew her father had an affair with her mother. But at first she didn't know there was another child already. Her mother told her that her lover and his wife were childless, that the wife couldn't have children. But, in addition to the ex-lover's insinuation, Alice found some letters that alluded to a child. She said that the first time I went to her yoga class, she felt a strange tug. It was like magic, and it frightened her. We looked out the windows as we passed the low buildings, the Home Depot I'd gone to several times looking for new flowers for the rusted bathtub. Looking for a thick board to slide underneath the wobbling chairs on my patio. Always I left with nothing. I had no money to spend. It was just nice to drive, to waste the gas, to smell the pine in the place. Another contraction. A bright scream of pain. I clutched my stomach and bit my lips. She pressed down on my thigh until the pain subsided. Why did you leave me? I asked. I was very upset. You fucked someone to hurt me. I mean the first time. 
I don't know. I was too needy. No, she said. But what then? I don't know. Something. When the girl came and stayed with you, something changed. I felt something I didn't want to know. And then it clicked for me. Eleanor's presence had kicked up a scent. Alice smelled the past on me. I'd planned on telling her in a way that wouldn't be off-putting. But when Eleanor arrived, Alice could sense it. The way I was just like the girl. I always knew the right way to deliver information. Everybody else did not. I think I know the reason, I said. What reason is that? I came to California to tell you. What, she asked. I just want to say, I felt so bad when you left. I loved, I love you. I worried she wouldn't say it back. I would have come back, but then you fucked him. That was disgusting of me. I thought I loved him, she said. But he's very stupid. We laughed. She took my hand and held it tight. She drove with her right hand on my left knee. Joan, I love you too. We looked at each other. The car almost went off the road. Another contraction split me down the back. We had so much to talk about that we didn't pay much heed to the fact that I was in labor. Do you want to know something crazy? I asked after it passed. She nodded and said of course she did, and I started with how Vic had cheated with someone before me. And she laughed for a long time. She said, now do you see I was right? Then I told her I killed Lenny. I asked her please not to leave me again because of that. I told her how I did it, that it was practically an accident. After the shock wore off, she told me it sounded like a true accident and that I should think of it as such. Then she said, it's all right, Joan. Honestly, sometimes I think it's the only recourse, killing men in times like these. She said it destroyed her that she'd never met our father, and she wanted me to tell her all about him. Her mother had told her some. They would sit and drink PG tips and look at the cows in the pasture across the road and talk about his swagger, how he saved lives. Her mother told her how once he'd brought her soup when she was sick with a cold. He'd brought her chicken soup from the drugstore reps. He'd specifically requested they bring the best chicken soup in the world, and he arrived at her little place above the oven in a white lab coat, and she was delirious with a fever, and she felt like she was in heaven and he was God. That's how society makes us look at doctors, I said. But there were also the nights our father kept her waiting the nights he never showed up because of his wife. It was strange to think about where we'd been those nights. Had we been at Maggie's pub? Another contraction tore through my bowels. There was one night, she continued, one night in particular my mother told me about. She'd made this soup, this pea stew. She spent the whole day she used the basil she was growing in a little clay pot against the window. And our father never came. He never called. She smashed the pot of basil against the windowsill. Her whole hand was cut up. She told me she went to bed without cleaning it. When she woke up the next morning, she swore she would never be hurt by him again. She swore she would not pass that pain along to her child. I laid my head against the cool window. Who knew how Alice's mother might have acted had my father done to her what he did to mine? I'd come to learn, in any case, that it wasn't my mother who was weak. It was my father who was weak to his own trivial needs. It was my father who had driven my mother mad. But once again, mad is not right. The world had set me up to believe that it was women who went mad, it was simply women's pain that manifested as madness. Staring straight ahead at the road, wavy with heat, 
I spoke very quietly. Do you want to know how our father died? I asked. What do you mean? She said. He didn't die of cancer. How did he die then? My mother killed him. She stabbed him many times with a regular kitchen knife. And then she slit her wrists in the bathtub. It looked like every movie you've ever seen, and yet it was my mother. And our father was on the bed. He was in the pajamas I gave him for Christmas. They were wool and brown with four-leaf clovers. Nobody in my family was Irish. Why? Because of your mother and you. She was shaking and asked me to please God tell her that wasn't true. And she was carrying on in a way my mother would have found hyperbolic. Another contraction. Alice became more hysterical. I worried about her ability to drive. But I'd been waiting to get to this point for many months. I'd been waiting to tell her. She was the only person who could make me feel less alone. Along the way, I worried it was possible he loved her mother more than he loved mine. But that was not the right thing to wonder. The right thing was, did my father love me as much as I thought he did? That was why my mother killed him. Not because he cheated. Not because he fathered a child with his mistress. Not even because she believed he wanted his second family more. Men love a second chance, Goja told me. They don't deserve it, not at a woman's expense. The reason my mother killed my father was because he didn't love her or me as much as he claimed to. I remember that time we visited Los Angeles and my father bought me that dress with the Peter Pan collar. I saw it in the store and loved it, and my mother said I couldn't have it, and then later that night at dinner he passed a shopping bag across the table. The bottom of the bag dipped into the juices of my mother's polo a la Voldestana. The coveted dress was inside. I cried with love. When he got up to use the bathroom, perhaps to call his lover, my mother said to me, you love your father better, and that is all right. I thought she was being petty, but suddenly I could call up the pain in her eyes, the unfairness that I thought he was the better of the two of them. My father did not love one family more than the other. It was that he didn't care about either more than he cared about himself. And just like that, I understood why my mother did it. And here was Alice, my younger sister, who of course knew nothing. I'd imbued her with a sorcerer's wisdom, and she was only a child. All she knew was happiness, the gift of a mother's love that had never spoiled. I wanted to give you that. I wanted to be good. I knew at the very least that I would be better. Did she plan it? No, I said. I don't think so. I also don't think she planned on killing herself. She probably just hated herself as much as someone could hate herself. Alice was crying so much that she had to pull over. I knew it wasn't good for the labor. But I couldn't stop her. She fell against me and I held her. She cried and clutched me. I said, shh, shh. And I told her it was all right. Now we had each other. I told her I had always felt her beside me, that it was one of the things that had sustained me, that, starting the week after my parents' deaths, I felt her in my bed snuggling against me, tugging on my leg as I got up to use the bathroom, smiling while she listened to me pee, trailing me into closets as I dressed, following me up the stairs and down the stairs, later borrowing my jeans all my old slutty dresses, reading beside me, asking me to help her with makeup, asking about boys, goja making barsht with ushkami, these terrible dumplings in beet broth, and us pretending to eat them, but instead snapping them into the dog's mouth, our beet-stained hands. Then the two of us under the covers in my bed with a little pink flashlight talking about our father, 
and we'd both look up at the canopy of our bedsheets like it was the galaxy, and I would tell her fairy tales. The ruby slippers he stayed up all night making. I told her he would have loved her so much. More than you? She would ask because she was only a little girl. Yes, I would say. More than me. I am absolutely sure of it. Thirty-seven. I want to tell you about Big Sky's wife, who, one Thanksgiving, right before all their guests arrived, dropped the carving knife on her foot, and it went right through the nail of her big toe. Theatrical blood blooming across the slate. I tried to think of what my mother would have said. She would have said slate was impossible to clean, that it would always be filthy. Big Sky told me the story, how he asked his wife if she thought she definitely needed to go to the hospital. He'd just had his first martini, the nice one before everyone gets there. And this was Montana, where you don't want to leave your house unless it's to go to the river or the mountain. I remember thinking, you are not a good man, thank God. But I only thought it then. It went away when he made love to me, and I didn't think of the story again until years later. In the hospital, Alice wrote herself into the intake sheet as my emergency contact. In the car, on the way to the hospital, she'd asked me who the father was this time. I told her the truth. I thought she might turn from me once more and forever. But she didn't. Look at you, she said. You thought you were barren, but you could barely last a month before you got knocked up again. Slut. While we waited, I asked Alice to show me a picture of her mother. She pulled one from her wallet. Her mother, Francesca, had thick caramel hair like Alice's. She was leaning against a stone rail off the side of a Tuscan motorway in a green wool sweater and a corduroy skirt. She was not more beautiful than my mother. They were both beautiful. In triage, my stomach felt like it was going to come out of me like I was going to give birth to all my organs instead of a child. A male nurse took my blood pressure, and it became clear that the awful pain was not just part and parcel of back labor. I knew you were too young, but I never expected it to go badly. Not again. The nurse walked away to get a doctor, but no one came for minutes. Alice screamed, My sister is sick! When they finally got me into a room, the blood was gushing and the contractions were otherworldly. A mustached doctor came in, seemingly unmoved. He talked to me like I was poor. He wore a wedding ring and a college ring. He asked me who the father was. Why does it matter, I asked. He nodded and told me my child was very young, too young, but that was that. It might be okay, he said, but it might not. The contractions came for many hours, but you wouldn't come down, and I was too ill to wait. Still, they didn't want to cut you out of me. They said the longer in there, the better, like you were a piece of undercooked bread, and the heat inside of me, even just a contact warmth, was better than your coming out, exposed to the newsprint colors in the air here. I have shown you the wreckage of my relationships. I know you won't make the same mistakes. I can feel how strong you are inside of me. I want you to know you were born of a tender union. A short but kind one. It was meaningful in the bedroom, if nowhere else. And it was the first time I used a man for something I actually wanted and not for something I thought I needed. I heard one of the nurses say, it's taking too long, we might lose her. I didn't know if they were talking about me or you. They acted like it was the end of the world, your being so young. But I'd already seen the end of the world, and knew better than they did. I knew you would live. One nurse, a peaceful woman, 
cleaned my face with alcohol, and smiled at me like she loved me. She pressed a cold cloth over my forehead when the contractions came. Hold on, baby, she said. Hold on a little bit longer for me, baby. She had small, elfin ears and a page boy haircut. When you were ready, you were so small that I barely had to push. I didn't catch you in my hands. The peaceful nurse did, while I was off somewhere in my head. I was thinking about Alice, how she would make a good mother, that she would play the right games with you. Hold your head under the bath spigot so that water didn't get into your eyes. I wasn't delicate like she was. My mother was not delicate either, only warm-bodied and withholding. Your daughter, your daughter, they kept saying, look at your daughter. It was a boy, the other one. I won't call him your brother, because I don't think he was. I like to think it was you. I have to think of it that way because the alternative is hell. That it was a part of you that you didn't need to bring. And that part of you, like a vestigial organ, was made to disappear. That's what my father once said of a medical bill. That's how he met Alice's mother, by the way. Alice's mother brought in a Mexican friend of hers who worked in the kitchen. The friend had a growth she needed removed from her neck. They had to work quickly, and the surgery cost in the tens of thousands. She was an illegal immigrant. I remember my father coming home that night. I was eight years old. He came through the garage, and I clapped for him. And over a dinner of pizziola, he told us about how two unfortunate women came in, two cooks in a kitchen, and one of them had a growth, and they saved her in the nick of time, and he made the bill disappear and the other one was so grateful. She cried and cried and said, bless you. They were each other's only friends in the world, my father said, or America in any case. My father is such a good man, I thought. Goja never told me anything bad about my father, nor did she really say good things about my mother, and she rarely said anything about herself. I don't think anybody could have done a finer job than she did, given the circumstances. I was ten years old, and she was an Austrian pessimist, childless by design. She had lovers in stone cities, and her husband, my uncle, was inconsequential. She tried to lead by example, but she also left me alone with what to make of my life. She held me when I screamed, but she didn't tell me how to feel so that a callus could form over my past. It took meeting Alice to understand the precise ways in which I'd been affected. How the night of the killings informed all that I did with men and all that I didn't do with women. My mother couldn't keep my father. Can you imagine that that had once been an actual thought in my head? Look at your daughter. There was a long period after they died when I could call them up. I could feel like they were holding me in bed. I was able to do this most easily with sleeping pills. When I went to the drugstore with Goja, she would let me select some off the rack, valerian and passion flower, vials with beautiful moonlight blooms. Like a scientist, I would make little concoctions out of them, mixing three or more tinctures in one. I used them at night, but sometimes I would drink them very early in the morning to go back to sleep. When I was 15 and still waking up screaming in the night, Goja gave me Ambien. The Ambien helped, but then the early evenings became worse. You would think the middle of the night would always be the worst. The witching hours. The hours I'd found them dead. But strangely, these became the most peaceful hours for me. In any case, the better the sleep, the worse the morning. If I slept soundly, in the morning came the job of reminding myself, your parents are dead, here is how they died, you are all alone. She's very sick, they kept saying, as though I had the flu. I didn't feel sick, I felt light. I was hemorrhaging. They ran bags of blood into the room. 
Don't ask men how their day was. If they are tired and look unhappy, say, oh, too bad, at the very most. I will have these few minutes with you, they said to me, before they have to take me into the white room. Look at your daughter. The past was everything to me. For that reason, though not the one alone, I don't want you to have one. Just these words, a small guide. Here is what will happen. I will watch you play soccer on an emerald field at a boarding school that is more splendid than the one where Big Sky will send his children. You will be running down that field and everyone, other parents, younger siblings, the opposing team's coach will be transfixed by you, by your long tan legs, by the winner's gleam in your eye, by your speed and hair and clavicle. You will be faster than the rest. Having come from nowhere, you will be more surely heading somewhere. You will always sleep on freshly laundered beds. You will eat wedges of lemon cake on English country estates and drink iced tea with woolly leaves of mint. You will vacation in the best places. Not just the good names, but places even the very wealthy barely know about. You will have enough money for most of your lifetime. You won't outrun it as I did. My mother left me all her jewelry. She left it for me in her boxes of hair color, which she hid all over the house. Clairol and Wella, and some old stained boxes of Feria from Harmon Cosmetics. There were thick gold chains with crucifixes and emerald rings, ruby and platinum bracelets, and the famous 32 diamond ring, which we used to count together all the diamonds. Later I learned they were just chips, and not very clear. There were also, I remembered, the little rosebud earrings that Alice had too. I think that was the part that made me feel for my mother the most. That my father bought her and his mistress the same little rosebud earrings. Perhaps they had been on sale. Two for the price of one. The whole bounty wasn't worth too much, but she used to tell me that she'd come back from the grave and bite my feet if I sold it. I didn't sell it. You may, if you wish. I don't care if you keep it or not, if you wear it around or never do. My mother was too much for me, and she didn't even live past my tenth year. I couldn't stop thinking about all of her things. All the books she read at the town pool, wimpled from the wetness of my dripping hands when I went to hug her. Romance novels with tiny print crowding the pages. The times we went to amazing savings, cartons of cheap things in dusty plastic packaging. Tulips. God, how my mother loved her tulips and her copper pots. I polished them for months after she died until the house was sold. Goja would have let me keep them, anything I wanted, but in the end, what I wanted was all of it gone. Look at her. Your daughter. They wiped you off and brought you to my breast. You felt vaguely amphibian. I didn't want to look at you yet. I wanted to savor the feeling. I wanted to delay the gratification because I knew I would keep living until I got it. They would need to take you away put you in an incubator and heat you. They were going to take me away, too. We were going in opposite directions. I want to tell you how bad that was for me, but I can't describe it. They said five minutes. Take this time. You should have this time. Finally, I looked at you, and I gasped because I saw that you were her. You were the girl in all of my dreams. You were on the Grecian seaside looking out of portholes. You were in the fast food parking lot waiting for me to come back. You were two and three and four and five. You were ten. You had been there since the beginning. And since the beginning, someone has been trying to take you away. I told the nurse closest to me that I wanted everybody out of the room. 
I didn't want Alice to come in, though at that point they would have let her. I'd been waiting for a long time to meet the daughter of my father's mistress. And I didn't hate her. I loved her. But this hard life of mine was not meant to lead me to Alice. I didn't come here for her. I came for you. I waited until they were all gone, and then I took your body in my hands and held you to my chest. I wanted to put you back inside of me. I ran my finger down the perfect slope of your nose and cried out the way I had after that first date with Big Sky. That primal, unlivable ecstasy. But this time, the love was real. I could already see you wouldn't need much from anyone. Your mouth rooted around for seconds before your lips sealed around my nipple. Then your eyes slipped open, and you looked at me. Your eyes. You have the teal eyes of a mermaid. Your face is indisputably stunning. Nobody will be able to look away from you, the way that I could not look away from you. Now that I'd seen you, I couldn't bear never having you in front of me. No matter what, at some point, I will not be there. I see you in the parking lot of a fast food restaurant. You are getting out of the Dodge Stratus and cupping your hands over your eyes. You're looking for me. I know I am here and you are there, but still I strain my eyes trying to see inside the store, thinking there is no way I left you in the car. I wouldn't do that if I were there. Please go into the store, I think. Go into the store and ask for me. Tell them I'm your mother. Tell them you can't go to anyone else, even if I'm dead. You can eat some food if they give it to you, but you can't go home with any of them. I go inside your ear and whisper, not even Alice. I have told you many things, but I have this other memory. It is the best one I have. I was five or six and sleeping in my parents' bed on the sheets with the print of the big fat cat. My mother didn't like cats, so I don't know why she bought the sheets. Probably they were on sale at Marshall's. I was sleeping in a butter yellow dress with lace trim, and I was very tan. We had just come back from Italy, where I was outside in the sun all day with the boys and the farmers and the little goats. And I suppose the most important part of this story is that I don't have an actual memory of it. All I have is a picture. My mother took the photograph with her cheap but reliable Minolta. Probably it is the early morning and she thought I looked beautiful. I did, with my dark hair about my face and my pink lips lightly parted and my smooth cheeks. Besides the jewelry and some of her finer dresses, the shower caps and soaps from hotels, and all of the good handbags he bought her. That was the only other item I kept from her things that she kept it, that she took the photograph at all, was the thing that sustained me for so long. The past, you see, was all I had. As much as I see myself gone, I can just as clearly see us in that fast food parking lot. It's close enough that I can feel the sunshine on the macadam and inhale the orange smell of the food inside. I look over and there you are, staring at me in this way. I can't believe you're really there. You're more real than I dreamed you. And you're looking at me like I'm your mother. We will enter the drive through and you'll whisper your order to me. I'll add two chocolate shakes and a box of fries to share. Then we'll park. You'll have my mother's golden waves and my father's astonishing blue eyes. We will drop shredded lettuce into the seams of our seats and laugh, and you will tell me to chew with my mouth closed, because suddenly I reverted to one of my mother's peasant habits. We will have money to live well, and yet we will eat dirty things in dirty cars. We will never lie to each other. You will always look at me like this. Thank you. 
Animal, a novel, was written by Lisa Tadeo and read by Emma Roberts. It was recorded by Stephen George at the Invisible Studios in West Hollywood. Editing, mix, and post-production by Glenn Incorporated. Tiffany Ferrari was the associate producer. Animal was produced and directed by Erica Weintraub. This has been a presentation of Simon & Schuster Audio. Animal, a novel, is available in print from Avid Reader Press, Simon & Schuster. Also from Simon & Schuster Audio, Three Women, written by Lisa Tadeo and read by Tara Lynn Barr, Marin Ireland, Nina Suvari, and the author.